I'm calling the October 18, 2011 meeting of the Tape, Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board to order. The first item on our agenda are the minutes of our previous meeting. Does anyone have any comments, suggestions, corrections to the minutes? Would someone like to make a motion? I make a motion to approve the minutes. We have a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? All right, minutes passed unanimously. Next on our agenda is the Golden Ridge Subdivision Amendment, fifth lot. Golden Ridge LLC is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Golden Ridge subdivision to add a fifth lot located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane under section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivisions. And this is a public hearing, so I will ask the applicant to make a presentation. The board can ask clarifying questions if, if you we feel that's necessary, and then I will open the floor to a public hearing. So whoever is here uh, on behalf of the applicant, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, uh, Mitchell & Associates, and we represent Golden Ridge Lane LLC. Um, This is the uh, 2009 aerial photo showing the outline of the property. Um, it's roughly a 15.1 acre parcel off of Route 77. Um, the access to the property is through uh, a private access way, a private uh, road, um, which comes off of Route 77, approximately opposite the, uh, the Kettle Cove ice cream store um, and provides access uh, currently to two homes that are not part of this subdivision um, and a uh, single family residence, uh, the Young property, um, which is part of the subdivision. This is the May 2011 amended subdivision plan, if the board remembers. Um, uh, we were here to amend the subdivision plan to add an additional lot uh, from the original subdivision plan. This is Golden Ridge Lane, uh, the existing Golden Ridge Lane, which, as I mentioned, is a private uh, roadway, a gravel surface, and it has a hammerhead turnaround located here. Uh, the the proposed subdivision would require an extension of gravel of a Golden Ridge Lane, um, approximately 500 feet, um, at which point there would be a, a, uh, a revised hammerhead turnaround, and this one would be eliminated. So this is the 2011 amended subdivision plan. This is the current uh, amended subdivision plan, which is before you now, and um, as we've mentioned before, the, the reason we're back before you is because of the town's requirement uh, during the May 2011 approval that required us to reconstruct the front portion of Golden Ridge Lane. Uh, this was not originally anticipated, uh, but the cost of doing that, as in addition to uh, extending Go Golden Ridge Lane, uh, far outseeded the, um, the, the feasibility of a two-lot subdivision. So we're proposing to add an additional lot. The roadway, all of the infrastructure, the utilities, everything uh, is the same as the 2011 approval. Uh, with the exception of this, uh, this new lot. Um, unfortunately, this, you know, there's, there's a disagreement with the open space impact fee, and this project is, uh, I think, you know, got down to this point. Um, so the next series of slides I've put together uh, to provide, to give us an opportunity to present to the board our side of the story. 
um, and to uh, convey that we don't feel uh, that the town has the right to impose this easement, this public easement on uh, this property. And we want to we want to also convey some of the factual uh, uh, elements of of this open space and back feet. So uh, under in the subdivision ordinance under section 16-31 paragraph Q uh, I under purpose it states in order to accommodate the expected needs of the subdivision for open space and recreational areas without diminishing the community standard of public open space spaces the applicant shall be required to donate land or a cash contribution there's no reference in this uh, section uh, to easements it goes on uh, we go on to say that uh, the previous approvals and this includes the 2004 and the 2011 approvals were found by the town to fully satisfy the community standards and project needs based upon the relocated and improved trail to, to Great Pond. The 2004 approval uh, required a, uh, or included, incorporated a relocation of a pedestrian easement alongside of Golden Ridge Lane. Um, and the requested change from two to three lots results in a neighborhood of nearly identical rural character as before. Our cover letter in your application uh, stated many of the reasons why the applicant is opposed to creating a public trail across his property. They include low value. Uh, we don't feel that uh, this, this proposed trail easement uh, is going to be a high value at all. Um, it extends from a five lot subdivision to a, uh, an existing business and uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, it's very sparsely populated, you know, a five lot subdivision um, would be using this trail, if any. Um, so we, we feel that it has very low value. Environmental impact, um, it will go through wetlands. It will go through uh, RP2 and possibly RP1 wetlands, which would require vegetation removal and soil disturbance. It may require a boardwalk. Um, it's very, very wet out in the back um, where this trail would be located. And uh, in order to minimize the, the wetland impacts, it may require a boardwalk. And, and the question is, who is going to pay for this boardwalk? Can I interrupt you just one moment, to just for a clarification of yes. what you're telling us? Because this presentation, is, it's a lot of it is new. Do you make any distinction between the three different trail options discussed by the Conservation Commission, or do your comments apply equally to all three of them? There is one section in, in the series of slides that, you'll address that, that talks about okay. the option. Thank you. Yes. Uh, permitting. Uh, because of the wetlands, this trail will require a resource protection permit from the town, an NRPA permit from DEP, um, and possibly wetland mitigation, all of which are very expensive for the town. Marketability. Uh, you have received a letter from the owner of um, Legacy Properties that indicates that um, an easement so close to a building envelope will have a negative or adverse uh, impact on the market of the lot as well as the um, as well as the marketability to sell the lot. And then uh, neighbors. And in my letter, I just question whether the immediate neighbors or the neighbors within the subdivision are in favor of this, uh, of this easement. <clears throat> um, my letter, my cover letter was followed by a letter by Lee Lowry who is here this evening and who's gonna assist me in this presentation. Um, and these are just highlights that, uh, these are bullet points that, that highlight uh, Lee's letter. The 2004 approval, um, the, an existing pedestrian easement over another privately owned lot was relocated to unburden the neighbor's lot. So the planning board 
voted to relocate this, uh, this, this easement uh, specifically to unburden the neighbor's lot. The 2011 approval, uh, this planning board determined that the town's interest was satisfied through the payment of a fee, and there has been no material change in this project since the May 2011 approval. This is the identical parcel. And the change from two lots to three lots has no bearing on accessibility to or from the Great Pond Trail. Some of the primary reasons for, uh, for the applicant purchasing this property included the following. The size and private rural nature, the relatively secluded location, and the land is served by a private dead-end road. Uh, these, these features were very important uh, to Mr. Goldman, and they are a significant benefit to these lots. And the applicant wants to retain the overall character of the property and area. A public trail would change the private element. Uh, it was mentioned in the, the memo that followed the Conservation Commission's meeting that option one could be put in the 30-foot setback. Uh, locating a trail in the setback area is only true if no consideration is given to the privacy concerns of the actual lot owners. Under landscaping of the subdivision review uh, are the findings of fact of the May 2011 approval. This planning board required us to put a note on the plan restricting removal of vegetation outside of building envelopes. So to put a trail uh, within the 30 foot setback will require vegetation removal and is inconsistent with the condition that was placed upon us. And finally, marketability uh, public trail would change the private element of these lots and will deter buyers. Uh, in the memo that followed the Conservation Commission's meeting, uh, dated October 12, incorrectly states that option one would not require a boardwalk. There would be no change in the trail alignment across the wetland once it leaves the Golden Ridge property. So I argue that any of the options, um, option one, two, or three, will require a boardwalk. This raises the question whether the board based their vote on erroneous information. Unfortunately, I wasn't there. I, I was there for the beginning part of the discussion. Um, there was a vote, four to two, for the easement. We left, and then uh, apparently the, the uh, this item was uh, reintroduced and voted again, and uh, so I wasn't there to uh, participate in, in this uh, in discussion of the various options. And even though the plan refers to it as a snowmobile trail, this is in the same memo, uh, it is not. It is an area in the woods marked with signs by in a butter and uh, a, a previous landowner. This use does not warrant the conclusion that there is a trail. And in summary, before I turn it over to Lee, um, this trail requirement has no relationship to the expected needs of the subdivision for open space and recreational areas. This trail requirement clearly will not diminish the community standard regarding open space. The public already has access to Great Pond over existing public routes and easements. And finally, the impacts listed above, uh, all, of the, all of the items listed above uh, upon this property by the requested trail far outweigh the benefits to the public. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the public, uh, members of the board. My name is Lee Lowry. I'm an attorney at Jensen and Baird, and I've written a couple of letters at this point. I'm going to be short because John did a terrific job of uh, actually incorporating most of my, my points or comments in my letter in his presentation. Uh, so I appreciate that greatly. Um, as John said, and I understand the, the uh, proposed findings um, 
that have been suggested with respect to value and the impact of value on the lot and the availability of trails. I don't disagree with the statement that having access to trails um, is a benefit in a neighborhood, and I think this property has that benefit. I think these trails, the proposed trails across these lots, at least according to in Mr. Goldman's opinion and according to his broker, are going to have a detrimental impact on the value of, of the trying to market these three lots given their particular um, situation. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note is that um, it's, and just one second, I just wanted to ask John a question. Um, it, and the reason that we were talking about the, I was writing about the ordinance, is I think there were two different provisions in, in your ordinance. One that talks about um, a desire or a goal of the community to have uh, public trail easements, and that's your subsection I of the standards. It doesn't, it's not written as a mandate. It's not your lot will be X by X, you will have a public road or a road of thus in such dimensions. It's not like the public open space standard, which speaks specifically in terms of, you know, a quantifiable uh, amount of land or value of land donation or quantifiable dollar and cents um, requirement. So I don't, you know, you have one or one provision that um, doesn't mandate the trail easement and then you have your public uh, impact analysis, which is money or a donation of land and uh, it doesn't say it doesn't say trail easements are public open space that's not how the ordinance is written so it's our position that the ordinance um, clearly requires a contribution of a certain value either in land or in money um, the board previously in considering this project has already rejected um, uh, the, in 2004, there was a proposal to um, provide to the town a, a parcel of open space uh, on what is now lot five on this plan, and the town re didn't accept that, prop that parcel that was offered, um, and, and instead just decided it didn't have the value to the town, so I assume that the monetary contribution is what was deferred to, and in no case has the town um, looked to acquire uh, an easement. So, with that, I assume that in the 2004 approval, the notion of the trail and reliquating the trail was provided as a benefit to the town and a benefit perhaps to the project and the neighbors, but it wasn't, the trail wasn't the public open space um, uh, substitute, if you will. So we're happy to answer any questions that the board might have on those points. I know that you have some uh, uh, a different view from your attorney, and I respect that. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have a question that you think we need to ask before we open this up to a public hearing? Or if not, we'll go ahead and start the public hearing. Map uh, Put a plan up. Yeah. That shows 77 in the adjacent lot. Mm -hmm. The original, I think he wants. I'm sorry. I think he wants the aerial. The aerial. Oh, the aerial? The aerial. Right there. I'm sorry, the aerial map that you read in Egypt. That's the one, yeah. And I will open the public hearing. Any members of the public who wish to speak on this application tonight? Please give your name and address when you begin your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Leslie Young, 8 Golden Ridge Lane. Um, I live in lot number two. Um, I'm speaking for my husband and myself. We are at this point totally opposed to this new trail uh, offering. Um, we feel that it has several causes on our property. Um, one, we feel is already a very nice trail in place um, that gives people great access to Great Pond. 
um, this trail that is being proposed, I haven't seen, um, Mr. Mitchell showed me, I didn't hear the con conversation, uh, conservative whatever committee, different proposals, but originally Maureen had proposed one coming down the new road that was being built and then looped back around to the original trail. Um, my husband and I were opposed to that thought also for, um, you know, we live there, we've lived there for 10 years, I believe. Um, people uh, use the trail, but they don't always um, respect other people's property. Uh, they come, they don't even use the trail that was made a few years ago um, off the road. They still walk the road. Um, then they get to our property and sometimes they, they tend to, when they're coming from Great Pond and they're lost, they tend, will be in our yard and all of a sudden they've popped out on our property. So, you know, you're offering now people other options just to cut through where our property line is. Um, not to mention that if I was buying a property there, I wouldn't want a trail cutting through my land, but you're just giving people way too many options now. I mean, if this new trail comes out and the first option that was proposed that they come down the new road built, then loop back around, people are not gonna take that trail. They're gonna cut through the middle of our property, which people have done already. Um, several occasions in the last 10 years. Um, just recently, yesterday, um, I actually had a day off and I was home and some people came down the trail that had never been on the trail. It was obvious because they got to the end of Golden Ridge Lane here um, and they stopped and they didn't know which way to go. They, they started to look up the new proposed land where the, the trees had been cleared. They started that way then turned around and figured out they were supposed to go this way. Um, in a, you know, I'm suspecting that those, a lot of people that use this trailer from the Inn by the Sea that are staying, they're not even Cape residents. And so, you know, they don't honor or respect people's property. So that's our main concern. And the second one would be the vegetation. I mean, we've already, you, you people walk the land. Um, the former owners did a lot of clear cutting that probably was unnecessary. Um, now that you're proposing this, there's gonna have to be some more vegetation cut. Um, I think there's already been plenty of vegetation cut up there, more than that really need to be. And, you know, that's the whole idea of these lots being built is to have the beauty, as John had said, for um, the integrity of the land. But for the record, um, the Youngs are totally opposed to this trail. Yes. Uh, Leslie? Yes. Can I call you back? Sure. Just for clarification, it, it, I'm hearing that you are opposed to at least option two and three. What, what's your opinion on option one? Um, as, from what I've understood, option one is the original one that comes down this road. Oh, no. Because I missed the, yeah. all three options. I, I wish I could show this to you a little clearer. This is option one. Option one is cutting through oh. our land in the back of our property, correct? No. 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 Up, up option one is, is up by the field then. Okay. You know, the thing is, you've got three options here, and in my own opinion, um, like I said, you know, you've already got a perfect, great trail. People use it. They put in that nice boardwalk um, a few years back so people from Fenway could get across, and since that was in place, a lot more people started using the trail. The first few years we lived there, hardly anybody would cut through because you couldn't. It was so marshy. Um, you know, I agree with John when he says that if you're going to make this new trail, uh, you guys, when you had that site walk, I don't think you really walked way into the, that marshy area. I think you kind of stayed up on the ridge. It, it's very mucky and, and... Is it mucky right there where option one is? No, it's not, but... Okay. And then you, you're coming back around. I mean, it, I've never, you know, I've only walked up there a few times when our friends owned the land, but, you know... I, it's hard to say. I mean, it does cut through some. It looks to me like that's staying up on the top of the ridge. I mean, through people's yeah, I believe property where he's John's proposing house lots. I mean, um, and I also along just want here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that would be option one. It's smoky in here. It's I mean, I've never walked that far back in that land border. I've never done that, so I wouldn't be able to tell you how smoky it is. I've cut up through here a little ways. Um, and I, I'm sympathetic that people are cutting through your lot. That, that's not right, and I'm wondering if there's anything that can be brought to the attention of somebody about better trail markers or something. Well, the, 
because it's good to hear that. My husband has told me when originally this trail was changed years ago, mm -hmm. we were asked to take down the signs that were there that said private property. Um, you know, so the sign was taken down. Okay. And since that sign's been taken down, a lot of people do tend to do what they, they come in from the back way and they get lost over here and they cut through and then all of a sudden they're coming down, right down our driveway here. Well. I'm sympathetic so. to that. I wouldn't want somebody cutting through um, mm -hmm. when you have a perfectly good easement back there and possibly we can bring that to the attention we, of we, the Conservation Commission and they can do something about that. We've um, never really been opposed to the home lots. I mean, we knew there was always going to be a house there, so we're not one of those abutters that come here disgruntled and don't want any homes. But I think just having the homes is going to be an adjustment and, and fine and dandy, but now you want to throw in a trail or just with this trail, so I think it's, it's necessary when you already have a wonderful trail in the boardwalk, and I just, I don't see people honoring it, so, I mean, and just to, on John's note that this trail on his, one of his memo thingies he had, this really wasn't a trail, it was more like a deer path, and then the former owners were friends of ours, and, you know, my husband and his friends made a, cut a few trees that had fallen down just so they could get over here. Not necessarily to the former Rudy's, but the former owners had relative land that abuts that, and it was just a cut through. That's all it was. It was never made for a snowmobile trail or anything. So. Okay. And um, totally unrelated to the trail, um, I remember that uh, at one time there was a talk about debris on your property. Yeah. Well, I just want to ask um, at this time, has that been satisfactorily cleared um, off? It has been. Um, we've worked with John and, and Mr. Pilk, and you know we, they have cleaned up. And, uh, and you're satisfied yep. with that? I wanted to make sure. We, I mean, as long as I'm, I'm to believe that still in the approval, they were going to have some trees planted. Yes, for, the planting um, will. Yep. That is you know, the That's plant. another thing. I mean, if you're going to have people cut through there, that was where kind of our budding, of, you know, our butter front for these new owners and we were going to put some trees lined up there I think in the original Papua. So. Well I appreciate you coming back to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? So, Seeing no one. The public hearing is now closed so we can move to the planning board. I'd like to start by asking Maureen to follow up on, on some of the comments that we've had from the applicant's lawyer. I understand she also met with the town attorney in terms of the interpretation of our ordinances and what the options are that are available under our ordinances. Uh, yes, so you all received the letter. It came in on Friday. Um, and so I forwarded that letter to um, our planning board attorney, John Wall, and uh, he reviewed the letter. He reviewed the the Conservation Commission memo, he reviewed the plans, and he and I met yesterday at 3 o'clock. Uh, he had some questions about uh, how, what the town really wanted, um, did the Conservation Commission really want a trail, I confirmed him, yes, that's what they were asking for. Um, his conclusion was that if the Planning Board would like to make this a requirement, that there is on its face um, not knowing exactly what you're going to do, um, but on its face, there's no legal impediment for you to make this a requirement. So this I'm more being happy an to easement for one of the three trails requested or yes. pointed out by the Yes, and, and I guess you could, you could splice it and say that the ordinance doesn't specifically say you can have an easement, but it says you can require land. An easement is a, a, a way to require land rights. And certainly the board could then say, okay, if you don't think an easement is legal, then you could just require that you actually be deeded that strip of land. And I don't think anyone, including the applicant's attorney, has suggested that you don't have the authority to do that. So um, asking for an easement as opposed to the more burdensome actual fee interest in the land seems to be consistent with what the ordinance allows. Um, I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Has anyone done a square footage calculation based on the amount of acreage that would be required as opposed to the acreage involved in these trails? Actually, I just did a rough calculation. Okay, great. And um, right now, the current, the other thing, um, the board should be aware that the town council did act on updating the open space impact fee the other night. 
However, this application has been deemed complete before the, plan, before the council made that determination, so we're still using the, the older numbers. Um, there's two new lots, so that turns out to 12,545 square feet times two, which would work out to a total square footage of 25,090 square feet. I just did a rough calculation that the length, just for example, um, option one, the, uh, the full distance of that um, northern boundary, I'm estimating at 870 linear feet times 15, which would be the standard width of the pedestrian easement, comes in at 13,050 square feet. So that's well below the 25,000 maximum that you could require. Now, you know, you can play with those numbers a little bit. You can, you know, widen the, um, you could widen the easement a little bit or you could do something funky at one of the ends, um, perhaps let it wrap around the corner where it is wet in order to give the town a little bit more flexibility about working with abutting property owners. But it looks like option one um, definitely falls within the, um, the maximum that you can require for square footage. Great. But option three, which looks I didn't so calculate long. option three, but option, uh, I think, in my meetings with the applicant's representative, it seemed that there was more than enough um, requirement for you to obtain option three as well. Great. Okay, uh, open for questions then. Yes. Could, uh, could possibly Maureen help me with item six on the draft of findings of fact? Do I read that correctly, that there is an enhancement in value Yes, and, and I want to be clear that um, I prepared these findings of fact in the event that you chose to require an easement, um, especially since the applicant has expressed some legal concerns, it seemed only appropriate for you to have the tools in your hands to uphold whatever decision you make. But that doesn't mean you have to use these. Uh, with that said, uh, I think you said number six. This is an item that had, was also discussed by the Conservation Commission at their meeting last week. Uh, it's also been brought up in other discussions. For example, Mr. Shalott may remember in his former tenure on the Shore Road Path Committee that there are documented studies that show that proximity to Greenbelt trails and open space actually enhances property values. Um, studies show that it can enhance it by up to 10%. Um, anecdotally, I think we've all seen um, marketing of new home lots where proximity to Greenbelt Trails has been included in the marketing because it's been considered a way, it's attractive to potential buyers. And that's contrary to what the applicant's yes. broker That is, is contrary to what the applicant is representing. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh. There's a difference between proximity to a Greenbelt Trail and having a Greenbelt Trail go across your property. Um, I mean, just this is my personal opinion. I wouldn't buy a lot of land if the Greenbelt Trail abutted my property. For the very reasons that Leslie Young stated, I watch too many people abuse private property. I see it every day from where I live and work. People who are out walking around and they don't if there is a sign, they don't, they don't respect it. They keep wandering. They go across somebody else's property. So I, I understand about having proximity to a Greenbelt Trail. Yes, that's, you know, a quarter of a mile down the road, and I can wander down and go for a walk, but it's not going through my land. I see them as being very different things, and I would, uh, I would agree with the, the. Uh, real estate person who says if it's abutting your property, I bet you it has a different impact on the value. Can I ask a factual question in connection with this real estate person? And it's something that kind of concerns me about your whole presentation tonight. It seems that most of the presentation, and including what the, what the neighbor's presentation, was really relates to option three, which is what had been on the table the last time we looked at this when we had fewer lots. And that the realtors, I, I guess I question whether the realtor was even aware of option one or even thought about 
option one and how it might be the same or different? Because it seems that most of the presentation doesn't address that option, but is really looking at the one, like Carol said, that cuts right through the property, whereas the option actually favored by the Conservation Commission does not cut right through the property. It goes along a rear boundary of the property, which actually, based on my recollection of our site walk, which we did before, is far away from where the houses are planned to be on the land, and is actually in a, in a, a, a quiet area of the property that is not part of what would be anticipated for the daily use. I think somebody talked about, well, maybe in the future, somebody might want to build a swimming pool. And the proposed trail might be near where it was discussed. There might sometime in the future be in a swimming pool, but <coughs> not where I understood there was any housing proposed. So if you could clarify that, that'd be helpful. So I can't speak to what uh, Chris Lynch had in his mind, but clearly he, uh, he had available to him the Conservation Commission memo. He refers to it in his letter. He didn't qualify his um, opinion, in my view, uh, as to one option or the other. So I'm taking it that he's speaking to, uh, to uh, each of them. And um, that's all I can say. And, but also, I think in terms of what John was saying about this trail going through wetland, again, my understanding is that option one doesn't go through wetland, and, I, and I'm not clear what you were thinking about the boardwalk. And I'm, I'm kind of confused. I think option one is in, an incomplete trail, so maybe John's got it. Yes, it is an incomplete trail. Yeah, when I was referring to the boardwalk, yes. I'm referring to the area off of the Golden Ridge property. Can you point to where, where you're talking about? Well, I mean, if, if option one went along here, it's going to stop here. Correct. And then it's going to it's going to go on to the abutting property. I think there are two parcels in order to get to Rudy's. Um, this is all wetland back here. And you know, the wetland maps say RP2, that RP1 can be avoided. I question that. I've been back there and it's it's very, very wet. So if there was a boardwalk, then um, any of the three options are going to require um, the same alignment, which will require possibly a boardwalk. Is there someone here from the Conservation Commission? There was some indication in the information we got that there would be. She didn't come. Does, can, Maureen, perhaps, can you enlighten us as to what the Conservation Commission was anticipating here? Um, I think. What they were anticipating is there's much less boardwalk that would be required because if you select option one, the, the entire length of that uh, on the applicant's property is not in a wetland. Uh, when you leave the applicant's property, there, it, wetland is unavoidable. And I can pass around for you. Uh, this is a map that the Conservation Commission had. And it's basically just a zeroed in map of the zoning map. So it gives you an idea that uh, the applicant's property is right here. So you can see if you go across here, you're all in yellow, which is non wetland. But then to get all the way to Route 77, um, unless we have some very generous participation from this property owner, we're going to have to end up with some RP2 wetland. I would like to point out that unlike the wetland mapping for the entire rest of the town, this wetland has been field mapped by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, when the town was doing the VA district regulations, uh, we paid, actually it was the planning board, who hired uh, a wetland expert to map this wetland. And, and it is probably the best mapped wetland on the zoning map. So I feel fairly confident that when it shows RP2, that it probably is RP2. And when it's RP1, it probably is RP1. So, Yes, it definitely will have to go through some wetland. Um, the, I can say that the Conservation Commission was completely aware of that, but they picked an area that had the least amount of wetland impact. Um, the town routinely has built boardwalks. We've obtained the permits we required. The 
Conservation Commission did not recommend that the, this applicant be responsible for building that boardwalk. Uh, most of the boardwalks in the town have been built by the Conservation Commission, where only the materials have been paid for by the town and it's been volunteer labor. So, I mean, if you want more information on that, certainly we can provide you with that. But the Conservation Commission was very aware of the presence of wetlands, which is why that option one had their highest recommendation because it stayed the driest for the longest. Can I ask one more question? Um, I can understand a concern that as we sit here tonight, option one is a trail to nowhere. It's from, I mean, it's from the existing Great Pond Path, but as you, when you turn off on what we're calling option one, you come to the end of property over which there are no further rights. Is it within the range of what we could do to reserve that easement, but have it become open only at such time as that path would connect all the way to Route 77 or some other point of public access so that there would not be a time when that trail would not be a through trail and people would just kind of go out there and have to turn back around, or they would indeed be trespassing? You actually, there actually is a precedent for that. The town currently holds an easement um, just north of where Arlington Road is, where right now it's a conservation easement over the field, but there was also a pedestrian easement granted once that, that trail could connect to the property. So yes, you, you could obtain the easement with a constraint on it that it could not, the, ex, the easement rights cannot be exercised until um, a connection to Route 77 had been obtained. And that the town would not go forward and actually construct a pathway right. until that, could, until it could be completed. The Conservation Commission um, frowns upon dead-end trails, so they, they typically don't construct trails over those easements until they have a clear outlet. I have a question for Maureen. If uh, it is the prerogative of the Planning Board to uh, require either land or the fee, if we were to require land, is there any reason that we have, to we have to specify that it is for a trail? No, you could, you could, just, yeah. you could just obtain a 15-foot wide open space easement that included pedestrian access rights. You would want to make sure in your deed, though, if you want the public to be able to walk on this area, that it actually explicitly said the public had the, walk, the, the ability to walk on there, because there are easements that just protect the conservation values of the land without allowing public access. Were you talking, Joe, about a, an actual fee acquisition rather than an easement acquisition? Is that well, what you're raising? No. I'm okay. saying that I'm just asking if we, does, I'm saying at this point, do we have to specify what the land is used for? You, you actually do have to specify it's for open space. You could, like, take it and then but open later space on isn't necessarily a, a trail. Correct. I'm sorry, John, you wanted to respond I, I to just, something. Yeah, before we get too far down, I, I want to, with all due respect to Maureen's uh, description of the wetlands, I, I disagree. Uh, the wetlands begin right here. This line represents the RP2 wetland limit. No matter what option you do, one, two, or three, we're going to have the identical wetland impact and boardwalk, no matter what option. Whether it's coming down here, it's going to meet at this point. Whether it comes over this way, it's going to meet at this point. So whatever option is going to have the exact amount of wetland impact. And I, I further want to say that if this board decides on an easement, um, our least favorite option is option one, because this puts the pathway within that 30-foot setback, which will require clearing, and it will put it right next to this house, right in his backyard. And who, who wants a pedestrian public easement right in their backyard? It's going to put it in closest proximity to a building envelope. I have some questions for Maureen. Yep. So Maureen, um, I'm curious to know more about the likelihood 
that um, this path would be completed and extended to 77 and, and also the, the expense in doing so. And it looks like from my map, I just, I, I think it's been mentioned, if the path were to be completed, would it cross, is it three property, the shortest path would cross three properties? Well, I mean, the, the whole expense part, the Conservation Commission has, uh, acts as the steward for the Greenbelt system. So they are the ones that are really trying to implement this. Uh, the planning board tends to uh, obtain um, easement rights and open space where they can, but unless you require the developer to uh, construct things or impose trails, that's usually done by the Conservation Commission. And my experience is that they are extremely economical in how they get this stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, they, they get annual small budget allocations and they basically build stuff themselves. Mm -hmm. As for the likelihood, um, you know, there are a lot of trails in Cape Elizabeth that never would have been constructed if they were, the rights were only obtained if you looked at the livelihood. The, the trail that extends from Route 77 to Fenway Road for Great Pond um, has, I believe, no less than six different conservation easements. The most recent one that created the connection was obtained just two years ago. So we do tend to look to the future. With that said, uh, as the board knows, the Rudy's site is coming into the planning board for site plan approval. I have asked the property owner if he would be willing to consider uh, granting us an easement to get from the back of his property line to Route 77, and they're already looking at their site plan to figure out a way to accommodate that. So they have verbally said they're, they're willing to look at that. Um, and that would mean that we would, have, um, we would have a minimum of one to three properties that we would have to negotiate some kind of access with, and the access would be in the far rear of their property that is completely obstructed by wetlands and of very little value to them. So it is my hope that we would be able to make the final link. Okay. And then John's point about um, needing um, a DEP permit, is that, is that true? We, and we, might, that a, we might a, potentially a need a permit. The, the boardwalk that is currently in Great Pond that people are using, uh, we had to obtain a permit for the DEP mm -hmm. for that. Um, the trails in Gull Gullcrest, we have obtained multiple DE permits for those. So um, sometimes we do require permits, but uh, you know, you're talking about a five foot wide path. Uh, we're not talking about pavement. Uh, it's a pretty naturalized surface. Um, we almost never cut down any significant vegetation. Um, you know, if you had some shrubs that were completely blocking the area, we would have to clear the understory. But we tend to work around any large trees. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty low-key type of path, and that helps when you're making your application. Okay, thanks. Yes, Victoria. Well, I want to weigh in. Uh, as we know, when um, the board met last May, we didn't have the benefit of hearing from the Conservation Commission, and I do want to thank them for their review and for the thoroughness of the report. Um, we've read the report and we do have the three options uh, before us and we also read where they indicated they um, are recommending this additional easement in the Golden Ridge subdivision because they were strongly influenced by the potential for creating a green belt trail connector to serve the subdivision with the Rudy's area and the Broad Cove neighborhood with Great Pond. Um, we've heard from Mr. Mitchell tonight, uh, Mr. Lowry, and, and I read your letter in which you indicated your applicant's unequivocal opposition to the imposition of any trail easement. Um, after I read the memo from the Conservation Commission, um, I, I was initially in agreement with their option number one. Um, I was looking at it as um, the advantage of this option is the location. Um, they indicated that it would be dry and that within the Golden Ridge subdivision, it would not require a boardwalk, and so it would not impact the um, wetlands within Golden Ridge. Um, this seems to best address and answer many of the applicants' concerns about environmental impact and the cost of installing maintaining a boardwalk within Golden Ridge and the possibility of those further permits. Um, um, but I do admit it didn't address the applicants' concerns about uh, the trail is a burden, that it's unfair and it would um, impact the value of your project. And as I was kind of mulling those questions over, I was looking at this map, that part of our submission package, 
I was looking at some of the other trails, and uh, I was looking at this trail right over here in Broad Cove. And when I was looking at this map, um, one of the concerns the applicant has is about multiple access routes. And I notice here on this trail, there's an access route here on Pine Ridge Road, and then when it goes through Heritage Court, it branches, branches to the left and it branches to the right. Uh, so right there, there's multiple access points in this trail. Um, as for privacy, when I look at this trail system in Broad Cove, I notice here on, uh, this is called Cove View Road, I notice the trail goes through one, two, three, four backyards. On Heritage Court, it goes right through the center of that person's property, and it also touches again on that neighbor's backyard. Um, once again, similar to what's being presented tonight about privacy. Um, another similarity is the Broad Cove Trail is also in the RA district. It's also on a dead end, and it's also in a relatively secluded area. Um, as for the adverse impact on the value um, that it would have to this project, um, I've been down in that area, and I, the homes along Coview Road and Heritage Court, um, I would have to say, are also very um, marketable and I don't feel the pedestrian easement has adversely impacted the value of that neighborhood. So based on the similarities of these two neighborhoods, um, I don't see where the Conservation Commission's recommendation is an unfair burden to this applicant's proposal, as it's not unique to this section of town, and I'm sure we could find other examples with trail systems in other subdivisions throughout the town. But um, as we know, we're not really bound to what the Conservation Commission has to say, so I always fall back to what does the comprehensive plan or our subdivision ordinance have to say. And when you go to the comprehensive plan, there's numerous recommendations in support of pedestrian easements. Uh, if you open it up, page one, the vision statement, it speaks to expanding open space and trails. And then when you go to chapter seven, um, our recreation and open space chapter, goal number two indicates the town shall implement the 2001 Greenbelt Plan. And in that same chapter, it mentions that the town should add to the Greenbelt Trail whenever the opportunity presents itself. And in our subdivision ordinance, um, it does provide um, provision J under the general standards of a subdivision about provisions of a pedestrian easement. Um, it also provides uh, for that opportunity to um, add to the Greenbelt Trail during development review. So the Planning Board now has that opportunity to implement the Greenbelt Plan when it reviews this amendment. So um, taken all together, um, I initially do support option one, and I would propose we adopt the recommendation of the Conservation Commission, because in turn it supports the vision statement, the comprehensive plan, which in turn supports the open space chapter, which in turn supports the town's 2001 Greenbelt Plan. Option one, um, to me, appeared the most environmentally sensitive approach, um, and I don't believe it's any more of an unfair burden to this applicant as the pedestrian easement that's in Broad Cove or, um, or in any, any of the developments that we find in town. Anyone else want to speak? Carol Ann. I understand the town's um, interest in, in uh, expanding the green belt and having more pedestrian easements and paths, but I, I also feel that there needs to be a willingness on the part of both parties to enter in the, into the agreement. And I, and I have a, I, what bothers me here is the forcing somebody to do it. The people at Rudy's are willing to look at this. They're willing to discuss it. There's a, you know, I'm willing to, to participate or maybe they won't, who knows? When, when the time comes. But I, I do have a problem with forcing somebody to participate. That's, that's where my stand is. But we're not really, I mean, you're, you're asking a future buyer to choose whether or not they want to live adjacent to a trail. And it sounds like you're gonna find people who don't want to and people who are quite happy to. And I think Victoria's point is great that, you know, all through Cape Elizabeth, there are lots of neighborhoods with dozens of little trails that go all through them that go right in back of people's houses. And I, I don't see that as a detriment. Anyone else? Madam Chairman, 
I'm going to ask this question. Is there any, you know, there's, is it, I know what the applicant has stated in this evening and in written correspondence, but is there any room to discuss this and come up with some amicable facilitated solution? Well, as I, as I mentioned, um, option one is the applicant's least preferred option. This lot, lot four, has a very small building envelope. You know, I, I don't know what the building envelopes in Broad Cove are. I think they're, they may be a lot larger, but this one is very small. Um, it will put the, as I mentioned, it will put the trail right in, in uh, that person's backyard. Um, if we are going to have, if, if the board is going to require an easement, then the original alignment um, down along this area here onto Golden Ridge would be our preferred option. I believe that's option three. Option three. <laughs> If we went with option three, um, what could we do about signage and, and it, it, what can the Conservation Committee do about making sure people try to stay on those trails? Um, the Conservation Commission has several different signs and um, we are putting them up all the time. Um, we actually had a problem with uh, people cutting through in Broad Cove into private property and once we um, made the connection so that it wasn't a dead end anymore, which is, is a real problem. Um, and we put up, we actually have signs that say um, private property, you know, end of, end of public easement, and we give those away to property owners at no charge. They can put them up as long as they put them in the right spot. And when the commission, you know, I'm going to take what I've heard tonight, bring it back to the commission, I'm sure they'll go out there and add more signs so that we can address these situations. But we're, we're open to doing that. Um, there's certainly opportunities for plantings to kind of uh, preserve the buffer as well. And the town would do all that, the planting? The well, I think we do some plantings, but we I mean outside of, outs, within, outside of our easement, there's nothing. I've had property owners also add plantings to areas. So it's, it's kind of a, we, we will work with people. Oh. Yeah. Lee, did you want to add something to? I, I did. I just wanted to uh, respond uh, to Mr. Olfeen's uh, question. Um, I don't think either John or I are here with any authority to negotiate a different solution. So, if, if uh, I didn't want you to take this is the option three as the least offensive uh, or the least objectionable trail, as uh, as Mr. Goldman's assent to that. Okay. Um, it seems so option three is the most injurious to the privacy of the people in those lots. So you're bringing them right into the center. You're bringing the, the trail walkers into the center there and having them walk on that road. And whereas if you, option one keeps them basically off the property. Now, on lot four, if you back a house all the way up to that property line, uh, up to the side setback line. That's your north. Uh, that's your north side. So you're probably, if you back the house all the way up there, you're not really creating much of a yard back there. So it, it seems like that's really where you'd want that trail in relation to the lot, anyway. Because if you put, if you set the house way back there, then you have the whole sunny yard in front, and that's where your pool would be. He's talking about this lot right here. North is basically that way. Yeah. I guess I'd be interested to see if, without taking a vote we could come to a consensus on the planning board that we would like to provide the possibility for a trail connection here. If that seems to be our sense, 
then we've now been told that the representatives of the applicant here don't really have the authority to come to an agreement with us. Perhaps the best option would be to table the matter, make it clear to the applicant that that's the conclusion we're likely to reach, and see if there is a possibility of them bringing back to us some location for this trail, rather than us trying to conjecture. I tend to agree with you, Joe, but rather than us trying to conjecture where it's most likely to be acceptable to the applicant, I do think it's preferable if we can come to some kind of mutual understanding here. So perhaps tabling it's the best idea. And I do also think putting out the idea that whatever we do here would not actually go into effect until this trail leads to another public access point. That's something that I think is, is a legitimate concern. Anybody else have any thoughts on that possibility? Does the applicant have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I do know that uh, uh, Sheldon Goldman is anxious to get going on this. Um, I, I, uh, I don't agree, Joe, uh, that this house, even if you put it in the middle of the lot, uh, you know, you certainly wouldn't back it up to the, to the rear setback line, but it would, be, it would be in the middle of the lot. The trail would be right in that person's backyard. Um, the way that this option is, is that it does not have an impact on this, this person and it has a minimal impact on this person because if, if you were to site the building uh, as the way I did, this trail would come out roughly, you know, where this property line is, the garage is on this side, there'd be a bit of a buffer. But here, it clearly is in that person's backyard. Um, this, this, is, <laughs> this is my preferred option. I think that that has the least amount of impact on the three new house lots. Being option two? Option two or three? Three. Three, okay. Which continues all the way down well, partially down Golden Ridge Lane to the existing east. That's right. As we originally laid it out, um, it has the same amount of wetland impact. It comes out at this point. The pedestrians would circulate down <coughs> onto the existing easement and then back to Great Pond. Yeah, but John, it has the most impact on the existing house, the Youngs, and whereas if you put it along the side lot line there, you would give the future buyers the choice of whether they want to live with that trail. In I other words, you're imposing more of a burden on the existing property owner. The young. Well, I think that option two has the most impact on the youngs. Um, because that would be, you'd have to clear that vegetation um, and it would be right in their backyard. So I, I, I think option one is by far the most preferable just because it provides for a much more diverse path and option two and three reroute back to the existing path and double back and use that existing path. And, um, what do you mean diverse? So if you were to take option one, you wouldn't, sh you wouldn't go back. You, uh, People wouldn't double back. They were doing a loop. They would double back and use part of the existing path. They wouldn't have to. Just seems like oh, option see. one. It's just a more diverse route, providing more diversity of landscape um, and a shorter route to get to Great Pond oh. from that, Hill on Rock Cove. That's and true. And so I, my feeling is option one or bust. I mean, or take the money. <laughs> I don't think option two or option three provide enough of a diverse first path to bother with, yeah. personally. Once again, I, I, I strongly feel, and I know that Sheldon would feel the same way as I do, that that location there would be you know, detrimental to the marketability of that lot. Yeah, I live on a quarter acre lot 
people cut through my yard to connect to the other neighborhood and they they walk in front of my house and I don't mind it and that's why I moved to my neighborhood and our assessments just went way up relative to the rest of the town so I, I actually don't agree with his premise mm -hmm. that that's not marketable I, I believe that he feels that but as someone who lives in this town I, I just don't agree with it I, I would have to agree with what Joe and, and um, Liza are saying that um, option one does seem preferable. Um, I'm also concerned about further impact on the youngs who do currently live there. Um, I agree. You could get somebody that moves in and says, I don't care if there's a trail system. And somebody could look at the lot and they could say yes and back out. It could happen either way. Um, but I agree with Liza. Um, I live in a very small lot, and people are walking the land behind me, and I'm one of the few towns in this entire town that has a sidewalk in front of it. And people are walking in front of my home all the time. I mean, there's foot traffic constantly. It's, it's a choice. I chose to live there. And, and I agree. My assessment went up, too, Liza. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I tend to believe that... that uh, sorry. Have to get a louder voice or a shorter distance. I, I believe it would impact the commercial value of, of that lot by putting the trail right through it. But rather than have people walking outside, it would, you know, as a commercial value, I think it reduces its, its value by insisting on the trail. That's my personal view of it. Well, I'd like to put a motion. For Forward. I mean, I feel like we need you to move, make a move motion this at, along. At, at any point, um, do we have any other issues here? Are we ready for a motion? Is there anything else that anyone wants to discuss about this? I, I have one. Okay. If it's, sorry if I may, if, it's, if the option is to implement it in the future when other plans are in, anybody that comes in to look at that particular lot or buy a property, something on that property at one stage, wonders what in actual fact will happen if something connects those two together if the, the, the final thing comes together and the, and the, the, light, the uh, trails are implemented. Or the, so I, commercially, that's an even bigger question mark. Uh, what will happen when this, or if it ever does? So I tend to believe that the applicant is right, that uh, there's an impact on their property by doing that. Any other, other than this trail easement, though, are there any other issues with respect to this application? Any other um, conditions that we need to discuss? Anyone have any more questions? Any, any other aspects of the plan? John? Will the board, is the board going to, if they vote for option one, are they going to vote to remove that condition on the previous approval? Which condition? That there can't be any clearing within the 30-foot setback. We'd have to do that, but, you know, that condition from the prior approval did allow clearing for installation of utilities and driveways. So we would just add trails to that exception, and I'm guessing that clearing for a trail will be a lot less than what you would have to clear for a driveway or utilities. Uh, just to be clear, that prior plan has never been recorded, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Right. So the condition we're talking about doesn't exist on a plan. It would just be perhaps uh, the condition that we've got here that no alteration or now do is is that even? It's a note on the plan right now, so you would have okay. to amend the note, note on, the, on plan the plan that talks okay. about what can happen outside the building envelope. So it would have, right now it says, except for the installation of, dri of driveways and utilities, and you would have to add and trails. And we'd also have to modify the note that's, that talks about the payment of the open space impact fee. Yes, and you, you would yeah. probably want to say the trail in the public easement. So I'm looking for that note. Do you know the number of that note? 14. 14. <coughs> It says trails. It's already on there. Yeah. Uh, you'd want to amend general development note number three then? No, this trails is already in. Already yeah, the number three is the one I was referring to, which is about the payment <coughs> right. of the open space impact fee. But it looks like the note on the plan already contemplates trails. 
So I think we're all set on the fee then. The Where's the fee specified? Uh, down at the bottom under general development notes number three at the end of item three. And that the open space impact fee has been paid. Well, but you could leave that because <coughs> you don't want to ever literally interpret fee because the open space impact fee can be paid with either money or land. So even that note is okay because you pay it with the conveyance of the Oh, okay. Great. The whole section is right. called. Okay. All right. You're right. Yes. So, am I, what I'm am I hearing that it would be deeded <coughs> land in lieu of. A fee. It would be a deeded easement. A de in lieu of a fee. In lieu of a fee, I think is what we've been talking about. Now, this, this may be a stupid question. Does that change the setback? No. Okay. That's all I want to know. <laughs> Liza, you want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Golden Ridge LLC to amend the previously approved Golden Ridge subdivision and add a fifth lot, the end of Golden Ridge Lane, be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the applicant provide a pedestrian easement to the town located across the northern boundary of lots three and four in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Two, that the applicant provide a performance guarantee to the town in an amount acceptable to the town engineer, a form acceptable to the town attorney and all, accept, and all acceptable to the town manager. Three, that a road maintenance agreement be provided in a form acceptable to the town attorney, signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Four, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of the building permit until the above conditions have been met, and that the subdivision plan has been signed by their planning board and recorded by the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Do I have a second? A second. But to discuss, I did not add the provision limiting the town's right to okay. Can you repeat, um, exercise just, that Because I was movement. focusing on something else. Can you repeat what you said for your condition one? Um, that the applicant provide a pedestrian e easement to the town located across the northern boundary of lots three and four in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Should we reference option one of the Conservation Commission's recommendation? I would, if that's the intent, I would. Yeah. So. Okay, so we could amend option one to say consistent with option one of the Conservation Commission's Recommendation dated whatever the date is. Um, memo dated October 12th, 2011. Victoria, you want to second that? Yeah. I will set minor change. Okay. Yes. Excuse me. I don't have it clear. What? What? Would you repeat what you were going to have here? Sure. Um, on to. Um, well, uh, condition number one that says the applicant provide a pedestrian easement to the town located across the northern boundary of lots three and four in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. We would add um, consistent with option one of the Conservation Commission's memo, memo dated October 12, 2011. I have a technical question. Since the prior amendment to this subdivision plan has never been recorded and therefore is going to expire, in that be it ordered where it says to add a fifth lot, I think we need to say to add a fourth and fifth lot because what we're amending only has three lots. No, you're, no? you're adding one lot. We're only adding one more? Lot, a former lot four has been divided into four and five. But it hasn't Honestly. been recorded. Have you, did you record that approval? No, no, we haven't. That's we what still you have the right to Does it. former lot four exist, though? Are you, do you plan to record it? Because what's currently... Uh, I can't say. We haven't told November 17th. You're going to have to let it go. Okay, then I think we need to reference our prior approval, because otherwise, it's, it, to me, it's confusing. Uh -huh. So I think we need to amend the subdivision plan previously approved, as previously approved by the planning board, whatever May, of our... Uh, 
May 2011. Right. So amend the previously approved. Previously Golden Ridge allowed. subdivision as approved by the planning board in May of 2011, and add a fifth lot. If we're keeping, if the intent is to keep that one alive. Do you have what you need for that, Rose? Yep, thank you. You want to, is that okay if you're second? Okay. We still got that seconded. Any further discussion? Do you, do you want to add any findings of fact? Mm, what does that do? Not particularly. It, it gives a legal basis for your decision. But I'm not sure that are all of these, for example, it's a finding with respect to imp uh, impact on market value to me is nowhere required by our ordinance and I would be inclined to exclude any, I would be inclined to exclude anything that is not required by the ordinance and that certainly is not. The only reason you would add it is if you were anticipating a legal challenge to your final decision and that you were trying to prepare yourself for that legal challenge? I'm, I'm comfortable with adding six of them. Shall, Which one are you not comfortable with? I mean, the, the one you're not comfortable with, number six. Well, I don't add, because so listening to what Maureen says and looking at this more closely, it does not, as with the realtor's letter that we were given, which actually comes to no conclusion, as to impact on this particular property. This provision six also comes to no conclusion with respect to impact on this particular property. So in that light, we probably, it, it, there is benefit, I think, in including it. it. It says as a general matter that in some cases this has found to be true, which I think you're right on that one, Maureen. So does anyone want to propose an amendment to the motion currently on the table to include this list? Joe? Um, I propose that we add the uh, findings of that to the current uh, proposal. Do we need to read them in the record? Yes, we need to read them in the record. One, section 16-3-1Q establishes an open space impact fee as a standard of subdivision review. The standard requires that open space be provided for each new lot in a subdivision. The planning board reviews the application that is currently before it for compliance with the standards of the subdivision ordinance. Two. The open space impact fee is based on the amount of public land available to current Cape Elizabeth households. Each new subdivision lot is assessed a fee equal to the amount of land needed to maintain the community standard of open space. The open space impact fee is periodically updated and adopted by the town council in the town fee schedule. The current fee requires the payment of $4,320 per lot or 12,545 square feet of land per lot. The planning board has the authority to determine if land or money will be provided to comply with the standards of the open space impact fee. Three, the Conservation Commission has recommended that the land in the form of a pedestrian easement would be a valuable addition to the town greenbelt system as further described in a memo and map dated October 12, 2011. The recommended Greenbelt Trail connection would provide public connections to Great Pond and the BA Neighborhood Business District for the lots in the subdivision and for adjacent neighborhoods, which is typical for all town Greenbelt Trails. Four, provision of a pedestrian easement as part of the subdivision review of the Golden Ridge subdivision amendment is a fair, equitable, and reasonable condition to preserve the community standard of open space. Five, a typical pedestrian easement is 15 feet wide and accommodates a five foot wide pedestrian trail. 
This easement can be located within the proposed 30-foot setbacks of the proposed lots without constraining the building envelopes on the lot. The pedestrian easement can also be located within the setback so that a minimum of 15 foot of width remains for plantings to buffer the pedestrian easement from the proposed building envelopes. Six, proximity to pedestrian trails and open space are often used to market home lots. Studies have demonstrated that proximity to a greenbelt trail or open space on average increase lot values approximately 10%. The Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan identifies open space as a high priority, and town residents identified open space as a high priority in the public opinion survey conducted for the Comprehensive Plan. Seven, some town greenbelt trails have been constructed in wetland areas to provide pedestrian connections and are allowed under the zoning ordinance with a resource protection permit. Potential conditions of approval. I don't no, think that's it. That. Sorry. Do I have a second? I'll second that. And this would be, I think, a friendly amendment to the standing motion. That's what I'm asking. Is, is, so yes. Yes. No need to have a separate vote on this. No. You accept the amendment. I do accept the amendment. And you seconded it, so we're all set on that. Okay. So, any further discussion? So, I know you did a quick calculation, Maureen, on the path. I don't remember what you said the number was. Um, it was about does it half. meet the require? How many do we need? It's about half of what's needed in order to meet uh, the donation of land to or money. Yeah, if the, if I think, I think what I hear the planning board saying, and you haven't voted yet, is that this is what you think should be meeting the open space impact fee standard. And I think there's a way that what I would probably, what I would like to do if this motion passes is to work with the applicant to adjust the width of this easement as much as we need to so that it meets the standard and the applicant isn't responsible for anything other than this easement. And then we can still put in a caveat that make sure that the actual trail is located as close to the northern property line as is feasible. So I'm... Do we need an easement? Do, do we have to take the entire amount of land? The applicant has to meet the open space requirement, yes. And I'm, what I'm saying is I, I'm getting, unless I'm told otherwise, that you want me to work with this applicant to make those numbers work. Could this be two parts, amount of land and re reduction in the cost of the cash payment? Yes, you could do that. So, so to the so extent the acreage is not the full amount of required acreage? You'd make it up with, uh, with, with, ca with a cash donation, yes. well, a cash. But I think we would need to specify that tonight, and we don't have to. I think you're right. Based on, based on a calculation of how much is actually involved in the trail. Because this is a rough... Right. So, rough so that you could say on the caveat that the basis between the amount of acreage donated in, is an adjustment between that and the overall amount that would be required, which was $12,000, was it? No. It's, um, it's either 12545 Square feet or $4,320. Per, per lot. Oh, that's for per, the. Per lot. Per lot. So, so this four for 20000 odd, yeah. yes. Shall so. we add a condition that actually states that the town will work with the applicant to decide whether um, the fee is paid in a combination of land and money or I just think, land? You know, it, it, you should make clear what your intent is. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sure. So we should add an amendment, to, or we should add. Uh, Mr. Lowry, would you uh, like to? With add all that? respect, I think you're either voting on an easement as des designated, or you're voting on money, leaving a uh, oh, we'll negotiate how much we think the land is worth versus what the cash contribution would be, and sort of uh, adjusting it is not really what the board is supposed to be doing. Mr. Lowry, yeah. Uh, yeah, what what I would. If, if the board goes with this route, which is not what I was suggesting, we would not be uh, negotiating what the land was ever actually worth. What I would do is a proportional 
you know, one lot is 4,320 square feet or 12,545 square feet. So if you were, say, to donate 13,000 square feet, you've got a little more than 12,554, and I would divide that into a percentage, and you would get a percentage of the $4,320 off. That's right. the only way I can think of doing that. Going at the value of the land is not contemplated in, in the impact phase. No, no, but the, the land, when you're doing a land donation, at least 20% mm -hmm. of the land donated shall be land which is not in a resource protection zone or buffer zone. So um, clearly the ordinance doesn't contemplate that all land is of equal value. So I'm not quite sure how the math is going to work out. But it's not the value, the, the land calculation is the square footage calculation. Right. Well, it does say at least 20 percent. Well, you've got 100 percent, so mm -hmm. it doesn't say you can't have more. Right. Uh, right, I understand. But, but there seems to be... Although the end little bit here may be... An I mean, so for example, yeah. <laughs> what if you came in and said, well, what we want for open space is the building envelope on lot 5. May I answer that? I mean, your ordinance doesn't treat all of the square footage as equal in value. And what I'm concerned about is there's the, the, trail, the trail one option, I think, Maureen, you said, is about 800 times 15, which is, what, 8,000, 10,000 square feet. I'm, I'm so I don't think... I'm at 13,000. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, so if, if the thought is, gee, Mr. Goldman can grant that easement, depreciate the value of his property, and pay money on top of it. My thought was to work with you to get the square footage numbers right, so you would be donating an easement only. But uh, it's, it's not it's, my it's, call, it's the, it, the decision. But, but I don't... Well, where, where is the other land going to come from? Well, the, the back boundary of the property... 300 is total square, the total length of the back boundary. Of, I mean, we can calculate it out right here. We have a survey of the back boundary of the property. Right, we, do. We, can, we can figure out the width, and we can come up with the exact width that we need uh -huh. to come up with the uh, square footage. If there's okay, any I, question I, that, we have the legal, that we have the legal right to, to take a narrower easement, which I think would be your preference, and allow you to contribute the balance in a fee, we can certainly come up with that precise calculation if somebody wants to do that. So we've got uh, three, one, three, here. Uh, we have that, I guess, seven. You know, bef before we go any further on this, my thought was that if the planning board is willing, we would make up the amount of land that's left over that we need for the fee in portions of the lot that are outside the building envelope. For example, if you, if you look at um, lot four, I mean, there is some boundary that is all RP2 that is on the southeastern side of the property that if we had some easement there, it would give us some flexibility in working with the budding property owners to make the connection. And I don't think that area would in any way um, impede the ability to use the lot since it is the furthest part from the lot from, from the building envelope. You're so, talking in the vicinity of the number four on lot four? I'm looking, I'm looking even further, the deepest part of the lot. Way back, Way back in here. And, and there's an opportunity there to just expand the easement with the least amount of burden on the lot. I guess my concern is, since it looks like we are uh, dealing with the possibility of a legal challenge, that we need to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, either tonight or by tabling this and coming back at a time when we have an actual calculation done. I'm concerned that if we leave too much discretion here, that it won't be sufficiently certain to withstand an actual challenge if that's yeah, my feeling Suggested. is the Conservation Commission has, if we're going to go with their recommendation, it's just one path across the northern boundary. But it's not and specified in width. calculations, it would be 30 feet wide instead of 15 feet wide to satisfy the open space requirement. 29.17 feet. 
So you've that added up the, the, um, length, the total yeah. length across the back there? Yeah. Caroline? Generally, at this point, the, we start the meeting knowing what, what land is being uh, looked at and how much, how much square footage there is that would be, that would be donated in lieu of a fee. So, uh, and that's what's making this difficult. It's, we're trying to, on the fly, do something that is generally done well in advance with you know, all the appropriate calculations that John Mitchell does. Uh, to figure it out. Uh, and I think Maureen's suggestion that rather than going to 29 point whatever feet, you, you kind of see if there's anything down in the wetland area that would uh, help make up the rest of the land. I, you know, land and maybe some money, it, it, it seems like a double whammy. I, I know we're, that it's either 12,000 545 square feet per lot, or it's so much money, but it does seem kind of awkward. <laughs> and, uh, and trying to do it on the fly is really. I, think, I agree. Uh, Good hazardous. point. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we could agree. It, it is it, it's not possible to do land and money? Is are we in agreement on that? No. No. It may be possible. Because that seems to me the most I've, reasonable. I've here. got an option for you. Okay. Uh, so my calculation, and anytime you want to jump in to help me, John, is fine, <laughs> is that that rear property line that lot three and lot four share is a total of 784 feet long. If you take a 15-foot wide easement along that property line, it's 11,760 square feet. So in theory, if you took a 30-foot easement along that property line, you would have 23,520 square feet which leaves you 1,570 square feet short, and I would suggest that the planning board approve a 30-foot wide easement with the condition that it not be used until there's a connection to Route 77, and that the trail be located on um, located within the first the northerly 15 feet of that easement, and then an additional 1,570 square feet be provided 15 feet wide along um, the see what are we going to call this the south eastern boundary of lot four so we would just go 1570 south. probably be going another 100 feet down here down that way so Which, marine are you referring to this area yes, right so, here? so my thought was so to start at the top it's, corner it's and go 30 clock. feet down all the way to the yeah, start at that top corner, go 30 feet wide all the way down that property line, all the way down, all the way down, and then all the way down, and then hook a left for about 100 feet, like that. 100 feet? Did you about, about 100 feet. We'd have to work it out, so yeah. it was 1,570 1, square feet total. But I thought that we were talking about a 15 foot wide easement. If we go 30 feet, then I don't have to go down so far, but if you want right. to call well, it. Even if we, we did 30 feet, I'm suggesting that the terms of the easement would say that the, the trail would have to be located yeah. in the 15, the first 15 feet on the northerly side of the easement. I understand. Okay. Could we entertain going 15 feet, which is the normal pedestrian easement, yep. and then create a wider box down there, I think box, well, yeah. it's up to the board, but I think that makes perfect sense yeah. as well. We still have more than 20% not in an RP? Yes. Looks like we will, because the, the first 15, the 15 foot wide is 11,760 square feet, which is almost 50% of the total area. And then we'd have to This is about half of what's needed, so the other half would be the This is a one to Yeah, that makes sense. So you'd be left with 9,260 square feet that you would have to accommodate into a square in that bottom corner, which there's plenty of room to do that. Do you agree, John? Did you find 
a little under 10,000 square feet in that back corner, you think, so we, without actually, she's probably, significantly yeah, impacting yeah. this lot more than we already have? Yes, yes, that's, 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 yes. that's, that's a need. That's, that's preferable to the applicant than paying the fee and having that. Yes. Uh, I mean, well, wait. Well, the, the only way. This development is in London, right? And it's really all just about the last three days. So, it's going to I guess I'm up for leaving it to uh, a negotiated agreement between the town and the applicant. No. Of what percentage is fee? versus how wide the easement is. I can write you a you condition. A split. Hmm? I can write you a condition. Yeah, why don't we ask Maureen to write us a condition and then talk about, I'm not exactly sure how to describe. We can describe the 15 feet along this boundary line pretty easily. The question is how we describe the remaining portion. I, I mean, you could say that the location of the easement be um, along the northern boundary line of lot three and four, 15 feet wide, and also an additional area of easement to equal 9,260 square feet located along the southeastern corner of lot four. Yes. Is it along the corner, or what's, what width do we want here? Is that what we I, want? I'm saying you leave it flexible, that um, you've got a total square footage, an additional square there of 9,260 square feet, and um, well, there's not. I can work with the applicant with the, tr with the actual description to get it to that number. So, you, so you've got a minimum of 15 feet all the way across lot three and four plus the additional square footage in that easterly or southeasterly. To equal 25,000. To equal the 25,090 square feet. Is this one? Is this one? Is this one? Or some more flexibility. Yes, it does. So that's good. Yes, it is. The, the Town, the planning board chair just asked who owned the other property and we identified it as the good table and that having an additional length as we've described would actually give us some flexibility in working out where the connection would be. Right. So. Okay, so do we have language here? I just read it and I think it's on it's tape. It's in the record? It's on the tape. Okay, so we need someone to make, and, and it, it includes that this comes into effect once and, right, and we'd have to we'd have to add that 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 no the easement rights not be exercised by the town until a connection can be made to Route 77. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have a motion? A motion to amend the motion on the floor. I need clarification. I need clarification on that. The easement rights would not. What, what the actual pedestrian easement wouldn't be constructed. You're going to take an easement and We would get the deed for an easement, and in the deed it would explicitly state that we couldn't activate the pedestrian access rights until we had a connection all the way to Route 77, which means you hold the deed, it's accepted, uh, but we can't actually use it for pedestrian access until it's not a dead end anymore. Okay, thank you. And all of this would be an amendment to what is currently condition number one of the motion that's on the table. So the current. You know, I suggest I would do an amendment. You have no tape rather than I didn't write it down. So I couldn't amend the actual wording for the, the amendment in your amendment. <laughs> but, you could reference that. Okay, so. The motion that we adopt an, an amendment to the proposal based on the reference that is currently on the tape regarding 
the access of the, uh, the land would be a, uh, held, on, held indeed until the connection is made or indeed until the connection is made to Route 77. We also need a motion on the location of the easement. Oh, the, the location of the easement as well is referenced uh, in, on the tape recording, that, on the tape of this, of the proposal. Which is option one with the extension. 15 foot wide easement as shown on option one with an extension along the southeasterly boundary sufficient to equal the square footage required by the ordinance which is 12,545 square feet per lot. Per lot. Yes. Per lot. Yep. Public record. Okay, so Henry, you've made, made that motion. motion, so we need someone to second it. I'll second that one. Okay, and Liza, do you want to accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. So is everyone clear as to what the motion is on the table? Anyone have any questions? Did we, did we raise the point about the conditions of whether, whether it was money and or accommodation or just, just land? As it now sits, it's just land. Mm -hmm. 25,000 square feet. A little more. Yep. Any further discussion? We're we ready to vote. All right. So, all in favor? of the motion on the table as it's been amended in accordance with what's on the tape. Raise your hand. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six in favor. Any opposed? One opposed. It goes five in favor. Thanks. Sorry. All right. That concludes the matter for this evening. Thank you. On our agenda is Fox Run Farm Resource Protection Permit. Take a minute to get our papers rearranged and then the applicant can make the presentation. Okay, the next item, Fox Run Farm Resource Protection Permit. Stephen and Pat Patricia Bothell and Robert Bothell are requesting a resource protection permit to alter 7,100 square feet of RP1 buffer to plant blueberries located at 90 and 98 Ocean House Road under Section 19-8-3 Resource Protection Permit and issue is completeness. may proceed whenever okay. you're ready. Thank you. Um, John Mitchell, I represent uh, Steve, Pat, and Robert Bothell for so this resource protection permit application request um, in connection with the blueberry farm operation at Fox Run Farm. Um, <coughs> this is an aerial um, to Google aerial of the property um, off of Route 77 
Um, this is the commercial, uh, the, the Bothell Mechanical uh, Shop located here. And right behind it is located the, an open field slash pasture um, that is what is known as Fox Run Farm. And the blueberry operation is at this end of the clearing. This is a copy of the uh, site plan that you have in your package uh, entitled Existing Conditions Plan. Uh, this is the Fox Run property here. Uh, Canterbury condos are located on the east and on the north uh, side of the property. There's a single family residence, um, residences located on this corner of the property. And this is the commercial uh, business located here with two individual. Uh, the Bothells live in this residence and Adam, uh, the son of Patricia lives in that single family residence. Um, the, <clears throat> um, as you can see, the topography, these are two foot contours. The topography in the central portion of the property slopes um, in a southerly direction towards a larger uh, section of wetland, which is an RP1, wet, wet, RP1 wetland. Uh, the very edge of the RP1 is categorized as RP2. Uh, this delineation was done by statewide surveys. The 250 foot setback from the RP1 wetland uh, is designated by this bold dashed line. So everything in this area is uh, incumbent with that 250 foot setback. The existing blueberry operation is des designated um, this little square. This is the uh, site plan, uh, which, um, well, let, me let me just go back for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, it's difficult to see, but these, there are two photographs here which are in your booklet. Um, this is the existing blueberry uh, plantings here, and then there are the looking, uh, let's see, looking north, the blueberry plants are located on the, um, the hillside. Uh, these uh, grouping of trees are located right here uh, within the 250 foot uh, buffer setback. Um, if you can see this dashed line here, uh, designates the limit of the blueberry, proposed blueberry plantings, and that triangular piece of land equals 7,100 square feet. So what we're, our proposal before you is to request a resource protection permit to allow the applicant to plant uh, inside the 250 foot setback uh, within that, that triangular space there, which would include the clearing of a grouping of trees in this location here. The grouping of trees is this photograph. Um, there are exactly 36 trees in that grouping that, would, that are within the 250 foot setback that would need to be cleared. Uh, they consist of a mix of uh, hemlock and uh, oak trees, beech trees, and I think there's a single pine tree, a white pine tree. Um, there is a tree inventory on sheet two of your package that identifies, so it's located right here, but obviously you can't read it, um, that identifies the quantity of trees and the sizes of trees and the type of tree. So, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. It's, uh, it's a request to plant the blueberry plantings and the clearing of those trees within the resource, uh, within the 250 foot setback. Um, it's critical, you're probably thinking, why are, we, why are we requesting to clear those trees? Why don't we just expand the blueberry operation? Um, it's critical because of the orientation 
that uh, in the amount of sunlight exposure onto the proposed blueberry uh, area uh, that these trees be removed. Uh, they would, um, they, they currently shade the area and in order to uh, grow these blueberry bushes, those trees would have to be removed. The remainder of this parcel is dedicated as a pasture land for uh, Fox Run Farm. Um, and it is bordered by existing mature vegetation on either side of, of the proposed blueberry uh, growing area. So that, that uh, pretty much summarizes our, our proposal. Yeah. So are you actually going to plant blueberries within the 250 foot buffer or are you just asking to cut down those trees to provide sunlight? Both. 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 There would be uh, the clearing of the, the trees in this area and then the planting of blueberry bushes in this what is now just open grass area. Okay, the issue in front of us is completeness at the moment, so before we have any more substantive discussion. Um, if the applicant doesn't have anything else at the moment, I think we can open this for the public comment period. Do you have anything else you want to add? At I'm sorry. Uh, um, we are proposing, um, as you've seen in our booklet, we are proposing to a mitigation of... Um, a protected, a 50 foot wide protected uh, strip of land that consists of vegetation now that would be uh, forever protected um, and that is a is a mitigation measure. Um, we're also requesting two waivers. The first waiver is on the one foot contours in the wetland area. Um, first of all the wetland area is you know, basically it's flat, um, and we have shown a two-foot contour in the wetland area, but um, I believe your ordinance requires one-foot contour intervals. And the second waiver has to do with the high-intensity soil survey, and uh, <coughs> um, we're not proposing any disturbance uh, in any of the wetland areas um, or in any of the hydric soils, and uh, we have submitted a medium intensity soil survey. So those are the two waivers that we're requesting. Do you have a description of what you intend with that 50 foot wide protective vegetated buffer? I don't see a note on the plan. There is a note on sheet two. Okay. It labels it, but in terms of what can and can't happen within that buffer? No, I don't have that on the plan. Okay. Um, but, but it, I, um, I believe it's, uh, can you read it? It's a 50-foot it wide. It just says 50-foot wide protective vegetative buffer, but in terms of what vegetation is, is in there or required to be in there, no, I'm I, not sure what you intend in that. Is would, there existing trees that you're committing to keep, or are you planning to plant something? That no, 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 we're not proposing to plant anything. It would be a perpetual easement to protect <coughs> the existing vegetation within that 50 foot wide strip. An actual de easement that would be part of the plan. Yeah. If that's what <laughs> if that's what the town requires. Um. Are there anything else before we open it? <coughs> okay, thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak? This is not a public hearing, but it is an, an open public comment period if anyone would like to speak. Seeing no one, we'll close the public comment period. Um, questions from Planning Board? Question. Victoria? Um, when I was reviewing the materials, I was um, looking at the first map that we were presented at an, uh, earlier. And I noticed that um, there have been some changes to um, this map as far as where the existing blueberries would go. 
I was just wondering, I noticed that it's been pushed over to the north. It's come down from the east, but it's also come up from the west. It's kind of shrunk. So I was wondering if you could tell us why it, it's I shrunk. Have... <laughs> this was presented at one point, and it came down further. It appears to have come down further. And I was just wondering, because you're asking to go over here so you could have some planting to do the operation. I was wondering, it appears, and I don't know who drew that. I don't know if it's how accurate it is. But I was just wondering why this is shrunk. I, we weren't, we didn't do this. The, the owner did it. But what we're proposing is the accurate delineation of what's being proposed. So we should look at this as a new application. Yeah, I got it. The, the prior submission was not deemed complete, so yes. Okay, so this we're starting over at this point. Okay, so the question is completeness. Anyone have any comments on the issue of whether we have enough information in front of this, in front of us, for this to be deemed complete? Comfortable with it, given the engineer's letter. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Um, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Stephen and Patricia Bothell and Robert Bothell for a resource protection permit to alter 7,100 square feet of RP1 buffer to plant blueberries on, the, on land located at 90 Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further comment on the question of completeness? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? And that is unanimous. So the question then is, is we at this point can begin the substantive discussion of the application. Um, we, can, we will need to determine whether we want to have a site walk um, but perhaps we should go to any questions anyone has about issues beyond completeness. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. It seems like a lot of work here to pick up about 40 feet of land on, on this side, on the right-hand side of the 250-foot setback. Is there some reason it's not all just shifted over? You're referring to um, this. This, this, little, this all, all this work is to gain this piece because you're clear here, right? To do the plan. Yeah. We're budding right up next to the existing vegetation on both sides. On this side and this side. Correct. About this side. That's open field. So I guess my question is: Is there some reason why this is not set back in this direction? Why you don't take this line and just move it over? And that's what I was saying: that this area, given the acreage of that area, has been dedicated for open pasture for cattle. Is that correct? Yes, for cattle. Okay. And we have even expanded into that more than what. Adam wanted to, but um, that's the limit. When you say dedicated, you mean used, not in some way legally restricted. Is that right? No, right, used. Okay. Correct. Sorry, did you say it's currently being used? I mean, there are cattle pastured on that? Right. Sorry? Currently, there are no cattle out there, but the applicant intends to um, have them out there. So for a, viable, for a viable cattle operation, you need that much pasturage? Is that what it's That's kind of right. down to? That's right. And were you saying also that the, sun, the sunlight would be beneficial to the existing blueberries? Yes, absolutely. Um, if, if, we, if, if these trees can't be removed, it's going to eliminate a very large area of this overall 1.3 acres of blueberry operation because of the sunlight or lack of. 
I have, I think one of the things that the engineer talks about and that we don't have a lot of information on is the um, drainage pattern here and the possibility that this agricultural use in the protected area will drain down into the wetland. Um, and one of the things that you talk about, but I don't see as a condition on the plan, is that any irrigation done will be drip irrigation. Be drip, right. And on a permanent basis, not just as a, the, at the installation time, that any kind of fertilizer used on this field will be at a very low minimum a minimum level and I don't know how you would describe that minimum um, and I think it's based on those assumptions that the town engineer has concluded we don't need more detailed investigations but if it's going to be based on those assumptions then I would think we would need to make it a condition of the approval that this kind of irrigation be used and that there be restrictions on the kind of fertilizer. Now, I understand that generally we don't do that, but since that is the base assumption on which we're concluding that we don't have to worry about drainage into the wetland, I would raise the question as to whether we might need to make that a condition of this approval. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I think it's a good point, something we should consider as we review the application. The other thing I don't see any discussion of is any impact of the foot and tractor traffic since this gravel access way is also going through wetland setback area. Um, we don't have any discussion of what kind of impact I guess eventually that's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic, but I don't know how often there's going to be tractor traffic going along what is also part of a, a protected area. We, we just don't have any information on that, assessing that. Um, that. You realize that's an existing pathway. Right, but I gather that with an, a, a significant expansion of the use of that area for blueberries that the use of that pathway may be intensified or perhaps it won't we just don't have that information the use of the pathway from what i understand and the applicant can expand on this um, but the idea is that when the blueberries are are ready for picking there'll be like I think six weeks in the season that they will invite the public to come and pick their own blueberries. And the plan is to park along this roadway. The public will not be allowed to, to circulate on the existing pathway, but they will park along the one side of that roadway and walk in on this existing pathway. And that's legal parking on the roadway there? It's a public road. Okay. And um, the applicant went through the Zoning Board of Appeals before he came to the Planning Board, right. and their findings were that the public can use that as a walking path as well as a, to allow tractors for the operation of Fox Run Farm. But I think we still need to, in, we still need to consider the impact of that on the wetland if what we're looking at is a resource protection permit and some new activity going on there that's not currently going on there. Is that correct, Maureen? I, I can see your point. I mean, I, I think what you're saying, I think what you're saying is if you allow blueberries to be planted in the wetland, then you're going to have more traffic getting to those blueberries and the path is in the um, in the buffer as well. So Correct. you're not saying that you're approving or not approving the, the path because it's existing, but it has an impact on whether you think more blueberries should be planted where they are proposed. Right. Is it possible to predict how much more tr 
traffic you would have um, given the, the more blueberries, uh, how, ma how much more tractor traffic you would have on that road? Sure. Uh, but, but, and Adam, you can speak as well. But my understanding is that the only tractor traffic that is allowed on the path would be for tra tra traffic that's exist that's already been happening to mow existing areas. So if you allow more blueberries to be planted, the tractor traffic for the blueberries would not be using the path. Is that correct? That's correct. No, but the the the. Uh, Tractors that are involved in harvesting of blueberries would be there, using it. There's no mechanical means, sir. The only or, the or only or tractors that are allowed on the path are to mow existing yard areas. Okay. So we're saying that there's no increase in the amount of traffic on the road. The existing condition is to remain. People. More people. pedestrian traffic, no more vehicles. I propose we schedule a site walk. Others agree that we would like a site walk? Okay, let's do that. Can we do that with the Conservation Commission at all? Or? Yes, the Conservation Commission also has to, has to take a look at this, so it might make sense to do it together if we mm -hmm. can. Yes. The uh, cutting down of the tree stand there, I note that in this documentation it says it should have theoretically very little effect on the uh, amount of runoff because trees absorb a fair amount of uh, moisture. But I don't see a report about or any calculation as to what would, how much would be uh, lost and therefore drain down further. Do you understand the question? I'm sorry, did I explain yeah. it correctly? And, and, you know, I'm sure how you would 10 or 12 or 20 odd trees I know absorb a fair amount of water but there's no reference to what that would be, the amount that that would be. But in, and the other question is, if you cut those down, would you replace them at some stage with others? No. What, what we're proposing to do is to, is to provide a protected, a 50-foot wide protected existing vegetated buffer. I, I bet, but that's to protect against sunlight being effect, being interrupted to get to the blueberries, I presume. We're, we're, we're asking for permission to cut these trees, the and, shown on the bottom. which is shown yeah. here. And we've taken a much larger area and many more trees and put it into a 50-foot wide protected buffer. Well, well, yes, the objective of the project protected buffers to what? Just to stop any further development? Correct. So, to, 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 so that those trees will remain there in perpetuity. Is there any reason why you wouldn't plant another stand of trees? I know it would take a few years to get going, but uh, other trees to absorb the amount of moisture that would be lost when you, or the runoff that would be lost when you cut those down. I mean, is there any, um, agricultural reason as to why you wouldn't put another stand of trees? No. No. I mean, it's, it's, it's surrounded by woods right now um, on both sides and on the southerly side, on the wetland side. It's surrounded by vegetation. The only opportunity to plant new trees would be up in the pasture land. If you take the stand of the trees and you move further down, you could replant them, could you not? I mean, not replant the trees you cut down, obviously, but replant the stand. No, no because what, what I'm saying is it's all wooded right now. It's, oh, it's entirely there. wooded except for geez, I'm stupid to me. Um, John, do you want to show your aerial photo? Batteries one. Excuse me? Your aerial photo? Six out of trees. Oh, yeah. So after you cut those trees, what will be on the land? Is that land going to be cleared, plowed up, and then blueberries planted in the area that essentially is currently has the trees and whatever else is growing there? Correct. 
And then what will keep the, I, I noticed that on your erosion control plan here, it talks about grass seeding until the project is completed. But on, on a long-term basis, what will keep that area from silting down into the wetland? Is there grass actually planted between the rows of blueberries? Yes. On yes. permanent, as a per permanent, permanent thing? Yep, all of the... Because looking, looking at the picture you had of the blueberry field, it didn't look like there was anything planted between the blueberries. All of the aisles between the blueberry bushes are grass. Oh, they are, okay. So it will be there will be a vegetative cover maintained. Right, it won't be area. it won't be exposed to earth. Okay. And where the blueberry bushes are, there's bark mulch around each plant. So we go back to scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have a question on erosion control. Yeah. Um, there's a letter from Barry Huff McDonald and Milligan in it talks about erosion control it says the more significant impact will be the management of erosion control and then it mentions some steps that could be taken have you um, looked at that letter is that already incorporated into this plan I have looked at it and um, he he based that uh, letter on a previous plan that was proposed that we were going to change the alignment of the access way and what he is recommending is that, um, I think what he said is that the silt fence ought to be extended. Right. Um, we have eliminated that element of the plan. We're, we're not touching the access road. Um, so we shortened the silt fence. So it does not apply? does not apply. So timing-wise, how quickly do we need to do our sidewalk? Um, the, a week from this Friday is when the applications are due for the November meeting, although we allow people to submit Monday morning if there's good reason. So if you wanted to hold your, this time of year you typically hold a sidewalk on Saturday morning. Right. So you could look at this Saturday or the Saturday afterwards. This Saturday is the 22nd and then or the 29th. 22nd works for me. Either one. Either one works for me. I can't do either. Either Saturday. Yeah, Saturday is not that good for me. The problem of doing it at the end of the day is it gets dark. Well, it depends on how, I mean, if, if you get out there at 5 o'clock, you're probably at, what, 45 minutes? For your frost lights? If that, yeah, it's, it's, it's all open. It's, can we do it morning it? before work? You can do it morning too. Yeah. That'll be good. Thursday morning? I can't do this Thursday. Or next Thursday. Friday morning? Friday. Friday morning. What's before work? Great. What's before work? <laughs> After the bus is 4 a.m. 6.30. 7.30? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. 7? Yes. Seven. <clears throat> is it light at seven o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Just barely. It I is. can't <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> to bring coffee. <laughs> I, I prefer seven thirty. It's a bit more light, I think. Can we do seven thirty this who can do seven thirty this Friday? Can the applicant do seven thirty this yeah. Friday? Yeah. Okay. Seven thirty, Friday morning. Where's the best place for us to gather? I would say on, on Windmill. Can you? Yeah. On Windmill on Lane. Windmill Lane. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Park on one side. Friday, 7.30, Windmill Lane. On Albert Conservation Club. Okay, do we have any other questions, comments before we do our site walk? If not, we should do a motion to table, and then do we want to think, consider whether we want to set a public hearing for the next meeting? Thumbs up. 
updating my calendar. Okay. <laughs> I don't see any downside in setting a public hearing because we have a public comment period anyway. Right. So we might as well make it a hearing. Yep. Okay. okay. So does somebody want to make a motion to table it until our November planning board meeting? I'll do this one. Carol Ann. <laughs> Thank you. Be it ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular November 15, 2011 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Do have a second? <laughs> okay, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry. <laughs> Elaine? I need to go. As to leave. Yeah. <laughs> we still have a quorum, so that's fine. Okay. Schedule. <clears throat> okay, the next item on our agenda is the Powers Resource Protection Permit. Colin Powers and Eowyn LLC are requesting a resource protection permit to fill 669 square feet of wetland to accommodate construction of a single family home located at Sunrise Drive and Lighthouse Point Road under section 1983 resource protection permit and the issue is completeness. Applicant like to make a presentation. Good evening. Uh, Bob Metcalf with Mitchell and Associates, another Mitchell and Associate up here tonight, uh, representing Colin Powers on this uh, resource protection permit application. Uh, sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint this evening. But, uh, the parcel in question is off of Lighthouse Point Road. This is the parcel in here. Sunrise Drive is an unimproved portion of roadway that runs along the back portion of this property. Uh, the last time we were in with the board at the workshop session, we were discussing uh, initially that the applicant had rights coming in through this um, portion of the right of way that was extended off of Lighthouse Point Road to get access to this parcel that was part of a prior approval for the subdivision on Lighthouse Point Road. Uh, at that time, we had uh, the discussions with uh, Bruce Smith in regards to setbacks in the lot because it was an existing non-conforming lot. We had 25-foot setbacks. We were able to reduce it. Uh, as I had indicated, that Mr. Powers had gone ahead and determined that there was a piece of land in here that fronted on Lighthouse Point Road that he was able to acquire to gain access to the lot to avoid wetlands that he was going to have to cross to get the driveway. Well, subsequent our meeting with the, uh, the planning board, we discovered that now it made this a conforming lot because we now have the correct linear feet of front in order to make it conforming, which now requires us to have a 30-foot setback on the side and on the front. So I just wanted to bring that change to the board's attention. Uh, the existing parcel has two portions of wetland on it. There's an RP2 wetland located in this area down in here. And then there's a portion of RP1 wetland here. And there's a cold remnants of an old culvert that crosses Sunrise Drive to another area of RP1 wetland, which is off-site. Uh, Albert Frick Associates is the one who had done the wetlands evaluation and delineation on this. And he had met with Bruce Smith to determine whether or not there was a connectivity between the two. And Bruce determined there was. Uh, but because it was less than two acres of wetland, we were able to reduce the actual setback from the RP1 wetland to a 100-foot setback. So the 100-foot setback from the RP1 wetland falls across this area in here. In addition, there's also a 30-foot wide Pup Portland Water District easement that runs along this portion of the property in here. It doesn't extend all the way to the back. It stops in this location in here. And Mr. Powers and the Water just for a discussion on location of that and extension of that easement. Currently there's an abandoned or, or turned off seasonal water service that runs through that location and the district is contemplating, Colin can correct me if I'm wrong, and the possibility of actually replacing that with a 
with a potential active line that could help me provide public water service out towards the areas on the other side of Sunrise. Uh, there had been an email that Maureen had provided to us uh, in regards to an existing trail that is on this site that wasn't shown on the plan, and we have gone out and actually located that. There's a, a footpath that's been kind of somewhat worn by the neighbors that they use, cutting across this parcel to get out to Sunrise Drive, and then the continuation along uh, Sunrise Drive to get access to other areas of the, uh, adjacent to the property. Uh, it pretty much follows the alignment of what the water district easement is, where the water line had gone in. I don't know if you can see it from there, but this red line denotes roughly where that pathway currently follows. And just about the width of what the ruler is, is what the 30-foot wide easement is in that location. Uh, what is being proposed is um, a reduction in the square footage of a footprint that we had come in before. We're a little over 1,600 square feet of a footprint. Because of the change in the setback requirements, that footprint has had to be reduced even further. So we're down to 1,229 square feet for a footprint. Uh, it was pointed out, I guess, after I was at the workshop session that the sketch we had shown actually had a portion of the house actually in the wetland that has been removed. The entire footprint actually is totally located in upland. As we had discussed at the workshop session, in order to be able to viably construct this house, we need an area around the perimeter of the footprint in order to get in, maintain the build a house and also maintain the area around it. So we're looking at an area that's roughly 12 feet from the closest point of the house out to the outside face of a retaining wall that will be placed in there in order to establish the true limits of any impact to the wetland so that there'll be no further wetland beyond that retaining wall. I know that was a question that was raised uh, in terms of how we would control any further wetland impact once the house was developed. So that retaining wall would be located along here. Uh, at the time we came to the workshop, we didn't have any topographic information. We have uh, topographic information now available. And this site pretty much drops down in off of Lighthouse Point Road to a low point in here. We'll be raising the footprint of the house up so that the finished grade is just a little bit above what the existing grade is out on Lighthouse Point Road. The existing spot elevation in this location is at 261. We'll be looking at 200.61 and we'll be looking at uh, spot elevations around it, we're in the house around 200.75. Uh, in order to get the driveway in, there's a finger of wetland that comes in this direction here. Uh, we're going to wind up putting a section of retaining wall, and we're going to wind up impacting about 12 square feet of wetland in that particular location. And the wetland impact for construction of the house is at 657, which brings us to the total of 669 square feet of wetland impact. Uh, the board had asked the last time in terms of where the leach field was going to be located. Uh, we had additional information done, and Harris uh, Associates Limited had gone out and identified where the leach field and the uh, uh, components of the uh, septic system would be located. The actual leach field, and it shows up in the site plan, is an area here. A portion of it will be under the driveway, a portion of it will be within the water district easement area. Mr. Powers is, has a, a letter which is in your packet of which the water district is in agreement to allow that to occur, provided that there is a 15-foot separation between the property line and the edge of where the leach bed would be so that they can come back in at a later date or when the house is, is built to put in that water line that I discussed earlier. And the holding tanks, uh, the septic tanks are located along this side of the drive point here. And therefore, the drive, the retaining wall actually is encumbering encumber that area to allow those uh, to be installed. Uh, public water will come off the existing main that's out in uh, Lighthouse Point Road. Uh, utilities will be overhead to serve. Uh, the limited clearing, I've gone a little bit beyond just uh, the some clearing that's already occurred in this area in here uh, from prior activity. And then just the limit of clearing is going to be held as close as possible to the limit of where the wall would go uh, to avoid any more disturbance if necessary. Uh, any disturbance that's associated with the construction of the wall will be reestablished. Wetland material will be excavated from the area of fill to be used to restore the area on the other side of the retaining wall to assure that we've got proper soil materials to reestablish the vegetation. Uh,
In terms of the house design, uh, we had shown you right in here a sketch at the workshop session of the idea of what type of house would be on here. Um, this was when we were looking at the prior footprint. The applicant has not had a formal plan done for the house itself. I'll just pass these around so the board is familiar with this. I didn't include it in your packet. But in terms of the architectural character, that's the type of image that we're looking at that would ultimately be built on this property. Uh, obviously, because of the changes and the, the setbacks and uh, the impact, uh, we felt as though it would be better to come to the board and get a better reading in terms of the, the impact before the applicant were to spend any more money in terms of looking at an architectural design. Regards to the drainage, and I'll discuss the, the engineer's letter at a later point. The, currently, the way the site drains, there's actually an existing catch pit set out on Lighthouse Point Road that has a discharge and a culvert that comes across and dumps into this corner of the, uh, the property with the net fire right of way area. Uh, the applicant has had a conversation with Bob Malley. There had been a head wall around that culvert, which has subsequently collapsed, and uh, Mr. Malley has indicated that the town will have to go out and re restore that particular uh, head wall. And the way the topo is on the site right now, the portion of the road edge in here that pitches back off towards the site drains in this direction down towards the RP2 wetland. There is a defined stream at the lower end of the RP2 wetland that crosses through the buffer area and discharges out into the RP1 in this location, which ultimately crosses Sunrise and goes to the other RP1. Uh, and then there's a brake line in which the grades on the site existing now drop off, flatten out, and in general, all the water runs towards this property line in here. So with the grading for the site that we're doing is maintaining the same character in terms of the direction of flow. Uh, from the driveway, we come down and across and go through a buffer vegetated area before it discharges into the retained wooded area and ultimately back into the wetland on this side. The grading on this side would be a stabilized vegetated area, probably grass at this point. We haven't gone to any great detail in terms of what type of vegetation will occur on that side. Uh, so that it will have sheet flow that will continue to go off towards the, uh, the wetland on this side. As far as runoff off the roof itself, we'll be looking at a drip edge around the building with a collector pipe so that once it infiltrated down through to a collection pipe and then would be discharged to the uh, upland area to the rear. Uh, and I know the, Mr. Harding had asked for some additional information on that. We'll provide that at the, at the next stage. Um, I think that gives an overview of what we were proposing. Uh, we had requested a couple of waivers. One of those was to for the one foot contours within the wetland area and what we requested was just to provide the one foot contours in the area where disturbance was going to occur and not have to do the one foot contours throughout the entire site. In addition to the one foot contours, because this area is so flat, we have shown spot elevations on there in the general area around the side where there really are no significant change in contours in that location. Uh, the other was a written description of the vegetative cover. As I said, Al Frick has done the wetland delineation out there, and it's done according to the Army Corps standards, which requires vegetation, and also with the town standards uh, requirements for RP1 and RP2 vegetation. There is no breakdown on that. Uh, pretty much the vegetation out there is mostly a successional, invasive type of plant community. Uh, site appears to have been disturbed years ago. Uh, there are some areas where you can see some ledged material that had been dropped on the site and some fill in the past. Um, so it really isn't a significant type of vegetation conflict that's out there. The vegetation within this area that would be removed uh, is pretty much uh, limited to more of an understory with a limited number of there's some gray birch and some uh, white fir that are out there. Uh, white spruce, excuse me. Uh, so it isn't a real dynamic vegetative complexes out there. 
Uh, we've also asked for a waiver of the high intensity soils map. Uh, Alfred has done soils evaluation. We've provided the medium intensity soil survey information. And then we also have the test bin information associated with the, uh, for the HHE 200 form for the septic field location. And the last waiver we requested was a, storm a formal stormwater report. Uh, and I know in Mr. Harding's letter, he's just asked for some additional detail in terms of how we are planning on handling the stormwater. We can provide that in a little more written detail and based on what I had just described, how we're going to handle the stormwater. Uh, so those were the waiver requests we had. I think that pretty much covers uh, the information of what's being proposed. Uh, I step back, I did forget one thing. Uh, when we were here the last time, uh, as we discussed, this informal uh, one pathway that the neighbors have created to get access, Mr. Powers had indicated at the workshop session he'd be willing to entertain looking at relocating that in another area within the site. We had discussed it occurring somewhere out within the buffer area and having to cross through part of the wetland area. Uh, at the time, we had talked about possibly putting a footbridge in. I had subsequent discussions with Bruce Smith, who said that it would require much more of an extensive permit uh, process for us to go through for the footbridge. But going with the Bark Mills Trail, which is part of what we had discussed, would be an acceptable alternative uh, or a better approach to go through. Uh, when we had located the, uh, the footpath out in here. Uh, it was at a time of the year where there really wasn't an awful lot of water out there. And I know one of the abutters had raised the question about standing water being out there. And I had gone out subsequent to that to take a look. And indeed, there is a, a fair amount of standing water there. But there are other locations where we can still cross the wetland to get to, uh, to be able to create this path. And as I said, on the application is to be field located. We haven't gone out and done an actual survey of where that would be located, but it would be located in such a fashion to minimize any impact and also in terms of removal of vegetation. So with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Okay, do we have any questions before we ask for public comment? It is on, the, the question is completeness, but we, we can't allow for public comment at this point. So at this, we are looking at the issue of completeness, not reviewing the merits of the application, but whether we have enough information in front of us to proceed on the merits of the application. So if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to the issue of completeness, um, please come forward. Seeing no one, anyone on the board have questions on the question of completeness? Is um, walkway access part of completeness? Because uh, my question is, um, we have a driveway specific. access permit. Where is the driveway access? Uh, maybe I should clarify. The driveway. Which road? Which road? The driveway is coming in off of Lighthouse Point Road. The driveway location is here. And it is Lighthouse Point Road. Yes. Okay. And That's actually, Mr. Pa Mr. Powers always has a access driveway access permit that uh, Bob Malley had uh, issued. Uh, okay. I believe I have a That's copy of that in your application in the booklet that we submitted. And that permit is in the, the current location of the drive. Yes, this location in here. This is confusing. I was just confused on the location of the drive. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on completeness? You're, you're intending to provide the additional stormwater data. You have requested waivers on a number of things that are significant to determining the impact on the wetland, but you're going to be providing more detail on the stormwater runoff? Yes. Okay. And in terms of the elevations here, do you intend to provide anything more here in terms of the final elevation you're proposing for the house and how that would affect the drainage? In the area the grading is on there the final grading you know, finished floor of the, the structure itself uh, the elevations around the perimeter of the house the top and bottom of the wall that's proposed to uh, along the wetland edge to be retained so it is a full grading plan that has been provided okay. and as I said this portion of the site is so flat there are no contours so we've provided spot elevations beyond the lowest contour that we show on here that reads 196 
And then the rest of this area is between 190, it's in the 195 plus or minus range. Uh, so we've provided the spot elevations to uh, show the board what the conditions are in that area. Okay. Any other questions on completeness? Motion, anyone? Oh, Carol Ann? I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say my concerns when I look through this are, have to do with um, impacts on the way the water's draining onto neighboring properties when you build a house. The, that's what I'll be looking for. Sure. Okay. Understood. <laughs> Anyone want to make a motion on completeness? I will. Let's go ahead. I have it here somewhere. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Is it Owen? Uh, Owen? Ian? Owen? Got it, Owen. <laughs> LLC for a resource protection permit to alter 669 square feet of RP2 wetland be, to accommodate construction of a new single family home located at 7 Lighthouse Point Road be deemed complete. Do I have a second? Victoria? Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, that's unanimous for those of us who are here. So we're now open to a discussion on the merits. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the merits of the application tonight? Anyone want to speak? Okay, seeing no one here, any members of the planning board have anything they want to discuss, including site walk? Yeah, I, I would just jump in and say I think a site walk for this is very important. Everyone tend to agree on that? Yes. Shall we go right to the scheduling question? <laughs> and I guess we have the same time frames we were talking about before. So one site walk on Friday morning. We probably can't do How about two. the following Friday? The following Friday morning? 28th. Works for me. Does that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Same time, 7.30? I might have to leave early. Okay. 28th. All right. So we'll meet just right there at the turn on Lighthouse Point Road. Right. The one thing I would just, in terms of the scheduling, yes. I would like Al Frick to be present on that. And ah. I need to confirm his schedule. So can we okay. at least tentatively schedule since it's next Friday? Gives me a little time to, uh, to make sure that he can attend that meeting. Yeah, I think that's, that would be very helpful. Thank you. And just for the record, I'd. I would suggest that you submit Monday instead of Friday since that's the day of the site walk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's appreciated. Okay. Any other issues that anyone wants to talk about? I would like some more in uh, some more information about the about the uh, possible locations for a path and and a better idea on on you, are you actually proposing to create an a a formal easement at this point I know there is no formal easement for that no, path no formal easement is just a gesture uh, mr. powers is making to allow the neighbors to have that continued access to the back there is no formal easement there now and there will not be any formal easement as part of this it, as again it's just a gesture to the neighbors to be able to still continue to have that access so you would finish or you would install a, a pathway yes. so that right okay Yes. And in terms of where that might be located? I'm sorry. <laughs> Your I guess perhaps here. some more detail in terms of where that might be located, if you don't have it now, might be helpful at the time of the site walk. We can uh, certainly go out ahead of time and try and use some rough staking or flagging in terms of where that path may be able to be located. And I assume you prefer not to have it where it is because that goes along your current driveway, if that's correct? Uh, pretty much cuts right, right in through the side yard, and that's also where you know, the grade is going to drop off, so that's not exactly an ideal location to have a pathway walking by your side, side yard. One of the neighbors commented that the dotted path area you show here actually goes across land that is not public and not owned by the applicant. Is that no. correct or that I not? I think what the interpretation may have been when we had shown this 
is this is the property, well, there's a property pin here, but the property sits back a little bit behind it. This area in here, which is the right of way that was extended off of Lighthouse Point Road when the subdivision was approved to gain access to this lot, is public right of way. So the path actually is within the public right of way. Okay. Then we cross on to Mr. Powers' property. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Any other questions? I have a question. You mentioned that this catch basin in the front there. Right in here. Yeah, dumps right into the property. It dumps within the right portion of the right of way. And it, it's collecting all, it's collecting stormwater from most of light. I, I wouldn't say it's most of lighthouse. It's probably a defined area. It drops down in this side here and it flattens up. So we're probably picking up from the upper reaches of the lighthouse point roads coming down in here. Okay. And you also mentioned that the house would have a drip edge and collector pipe. You're talking about a collector pipe underground? Yes, it would be underground. So it would allow the runoff to infiltrate through a soil medium before it actually got to a collection pipe, and then it would be discharged. So where you have shown as the location of the residence, is that essentially your building envelope and that is something that we could identify as a building envelope and therefore restrict things outside of that building envelope? Is seems like that you don't have a lot of other flexibility to locate a house in any event. Is no. that right? The footprint that we've put on there really is to is again, the house has not been designed, but looking at it in terms of square footage, it pretty much maxes out the area in which is available upland area, if you will, to be able to build a home. So, I mean, there really is not, as we said, the 30 foot setback line runs right along here, so that corner of the, of the house sits just a little off the setback line. That part here is pretty close to the setback line. Uh, we really can't bring the garage any further forward the way the setback line is. You know, unless you want to have kind of an obtuse angle in that location. And we're pretty much holding the 30-foot setback line on here. This line and the side line are not parallel, so it's not a true 90 degree. So we're a little off the side setback in this location and touching the side setback in the rear corner. So we could designate that as a building envelope on the plan with the provision that there would be no clearing or other removal of vegetation outside of that area except was it, it's for driveways and trails and utilities. and utilities yeah i would think that's pretty much max what you can do out there i really couldn't do anything else beyond that so because that again helps us define the area of the drainage from which we need to be concerned about the only question i'll ask is that since the house hasn't been designed right and as i said we've maxed the footprint out the footprint may change, so it may not be exactly that, but wouldn't exceed the footprint that's being shown on it. And would be within the boundaries of the foot that... Correct. Okay. Yeah, but you're showing, for instance, on this side setback, um, along here, if you're saying you can't clear any of that, you, you'd be have woods right up to the house? Oh, no, no, no. The clearing would have to occur within that 30 foot wide easement. I mean, I thought you were talking about in terms of clearing for the footprint for the house. Because we're raising the grade four mm -hmm. feet, you know, I need to be able to get back down to grade. So this whole right hand side of the site within that 30 foot uh, So you'd utility, clear right to the property line. We would be, plus the water district wants to come back in uh, and replace that water line with a new water line. And that line would be right in this location here, so they would be clearing that area in order to install a water line anyway. Which would be permitted in terms of the standard exception for utilities. So pretty much that whole area has to be cleared in order to do the grading and then I mean, the installation. I'm thinking that I can work with the applicant just to make sure appropriate notes are added to the plans sure. regarding clearing envelopes and building envelopes. Okay. Okay. Great. Terrific. And then we can kind of walk the boundaries of those envelopes when we're out there. Anybody else have questions? Um, 
when you come back next time, the, um, we do have a letter from, um, let's see, from the town in regards to um, making sure the design proposing a retaining wall, that that retaining wall um, detail should be provided, and that the um, silt fence barrier should be depicted to control impact, um, and erosion and sediment notes and details should be added to the plan? Yes. There were notes on and a silt fence was located on the plan. But given the scale of the plan and so much information as possible, it may have been missed, and we'll, we'll clarify that. And in terms of the retaining wall, uh, the material of that had not been selected at this particular time. What we'll do is we'll show a, a retaining wall that if, when the house is built, they want to use something different, they would come back in with a building permit and provide a, a different detail for that. So right now we'll show it as one of the, uh, the modular block type walls. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, then we would entertain a motion to table this to the next meeting, probably again with the public here. I'll do it if sure. I'll do the easy one. Okay. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular November 15, 2011 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. We have a second. second. No. Any further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Next item on our agenda, In by the Sea 600 Cottage Site Plan Amendments. by the Sea LLC is requesting amendments to the previously approved site plan for the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bowery Beach Road to demolish and rebuild the 600 cottages under section 199 site plan amendments and the issue before us is completeness. When you're ready, go right ahead with your presentation there. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Bradstreet with Oak Engineers. Uh, representing the In by the Sea and Olympia companies. Um, we were before the board the end of last year in the fall, uh, received uh, approval in December for modifications, uh, demolition of the existing 600 cottage and rebuilding of that uh, uh, cottage to um, town standards and, and uh, met all the requirements. What has changed uh, over the uh, winter months and spring of this uh, year is that um, some of you will recall because you were on the board that uh, we had two internal stairwells. Um, there was a, uh, a change of uh, thought on, on how that building should operate and, uh, and uh, be laid out and it was decided that the uh, internal um, stairwells should be external to give a uh, develop additional space and then also the uh, the basement facility that was in there that uh, was being used primarily for uh, storage of um, maintenance um, uh, type products thus eliminating the shed that we had outside um, would be eliminated too so that came back um, early uh, this summer uh, with those changes and came back with two external um, stairwells uh, in this location and back here uh, with a relocation um, and or keeping the, the existing shed. The shed is in this location here. Um, Obviously, the building here with the uh, two stairwells and then a network of uh, 
walkways. Uh, if you recall from, or some of you might recall, there were four walkways out here to the four front units, and there were two walkways uh, back to the stairwells back here. Now with the new configuration, one walkway out front, um, parking lot side, two on the ocean side, one on this end to the stairwell, and one, uh, one to this end over here. What is easier to see, probably, uh, this is the uh, typical site plan with the grading, the utilities on it, uh, is the landscaping plan, which really details uh, a lot more on what uh, you would be able to see uh, out on site uh, and how it is being buffered from the parking lot um, and, and everything. It's, it's, a, it's much more detailed. Uh, plan for that. We did not change really a whole lot. Uh, all the utilities are the same, uh, the sewer, the water, the uh, storm drain uh, utilities coming to the building are all the same. Uh, we still have the ability to uh, put up a, a wedding tent on the side. That has not changed at all. Same exact location. A service tent in this area uh, for wedding uh, Weddings or other events, not necessarily weddings, but uh, other events. Um, but the primary uh, change on that that you can see is we kept this, uh, the shed in this location, still provided landscaping around the back side of it, which is not there uh, really today, and kept this major corridor to bring um, the uh, guests from the main uh, building, the restaurant, whatever function might be there, over to this area through a major corridor that is segregated, separated, so that these people that may not be in attendance there uh, feel that they have their own space. Um, we kept front yard areas for the tenants on the front floor, uh, so they have a a sort of a private lawn outlooking uh, over, the, over the ocean. So in, in all, I mean overall, the, um, the site plan, yes it did change the configuration. Uh, we did not change the overall uh, square footage beyond what we could uh, or allowed by ordinance in that zone of the 25%. Um, the impervious area, uh, I believe I had like 211 square foot credit uh, the last time. I believe I'm down to about 135, and that was because I added back in the shed, but I took out some of the walkway. So I'm still on the, on the uh, credit side as far as the impervious area. So as far as the stormwater is concerned, uh, there was no need to uh, provide uh, stormwater calculations, which uh, have been reviewed by... Um, the peer review engineer and agreed with um, that premise. Uh, I guess with that being said, um, I would like to uh, have uh, Scott Tease from uh, TFH Architects get up and at least uh, uh, hit on the high points of the architecture and then any other um, changes that we have made or will be making that we want to bring to your attention tonight. Right. Scott Tease, TFH Architects. Um, in going through the approval process uh, with the authorities, uh, namely uh, local Bruce Smith, uh, who reviews uh, the ordinance as well as um, IBC building code, and with the state fire marshal, um, one of the concerns we had was um, to make sure that we were in compliance with uh, all applicable uh, codes and ordinance. What we found out in the last couple of weeks was that despite the fact that we were in compliance with life safety and that Bruce was comfortable with it, there is a Title 25 state law which essentially says that every 
hotel unit will have two separate means of egress now as and, and accessible as Steve pointed out the project did have two means of egress two stairs but they were not interconnected so what has evolved over the last several weeks is that I think it's very important that the square footage um, since we have a formula that we have to follow has not has, has not changed uh, nor has the uh, cubic volume, which again is arrived at by formula. But we have shifted a stair and we've also opted to add an elevator. So what I'm showing you this evening is the same floor plan as you can see here, stair and stair. This is the same floor plan, obviously at a larger scale. The floor plan, the stair, which is here, is being shifted over to the location which would be in this lawn. Uh, same size stair. It is an open stair as it was previously. Um, the stair, the second stair, um, which is located, again, the gray and shown here with the walk coming next to it, moved out four feet. And we then put an elevator in. The stairs are open, so that volume does not get counted according to the ordinance. However, the elevator um, is... Um, basically has a cover and has a volume and that is figured into the calculations. So um, what, we're, what, we're, um, what has evolved over the last several weeks is a slight modification to the floor plan. The elevations, as we showed you in the workshop session, are ostensibly the same, but they're going through refinement, which is what we're proposing to uh, resubmit before uh, the end of next week so that we can have a formal um, uh, public hearing um, in November. Um, rather than go through the nuances of those changes this evening, we've opted not to do that um, because what we want to show you is what we're actually going to be billed and not continue to bother you with coming back with these, with these uh, modifications. So it's with apology, but I think that at the end of the day we'll end up with a better building that will have um, certainly be totally code compliant um, and have better access for the users. Steve, do you want to summarize? I think what we wanted to do uh, tonight is um, we were on the agenda. We wanted to present what we had submitted, what is in front of you, but also um, bring to light the uh, changes that have only occurred in the last couple of weeks that um, we could not address and resubmit uh, to you for a, a final decision tonight. So what we're asking is that uh, we be allowed to go back, make these revisions to my plans, to Scott's plans, uh, resubmit by next Friday the 28th, and uh, be scheduled for a public hearing uh, the first uh, November meeting, which I believe is November 15th. Uh, so that is what our intent is uh, Actually, our intent was to get approval tonight, but that's, that's not happening. So we want to be able to at least uh, bring you up to date on everything that's happening. And um, if there's any questions or anything, we'd be happy to answer them. But we know we'll be back here again next month. Do, would you still like a determination as to completeness tonight? Uh, yes, I, I, I guess because the only thing that um, we would be resubmitting would be just the plans next time there would be no additional application or backup information or documents uh, the booklet the green booklet primarily uh, I don't believe that we would need to uh, resubmit uh, Maureen can correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's primarily just the plans just with changes with the changes you, you don't want to recopy everything that was submitted no. tonight only the stuff that's changed yes do you see any bar to a complete? Well, this is an amendment too, so the board doesn't have the same requirement for a formal vote for completeness. You usually tend to you know, do it a little less formally. You come to a consensus that there's sufficient information to conduct the review. So you've got a lot more flexibility on this one. Okay. Anyone have any questions before we ask for public comment? Is there anyone? from the public who would like to speak on this application tonight. Doesn't look like it. Pretty empty hall at the moment. <laughs> okay, any members of the board have any comments, questions here? 
Yeah. <laughs> your, uh, your, your drawing on there with the staircases sitting out there, I assume you're going to put some means to get to the staircases in. <laughs> that, that, that's a pretty good plan here. I assume there's going to be some corridors to allow you to have access and entry to the two individual, into the uh, uh, rooms there. That, that is correct. And, and what uh, Scott will present on the uh, floor plans is what is difficult to see is this line or dashed line is actually the outside of a um, a deck, a porch area, and that interconnects the stairwells with entrances into each of the units in either direction. So that is that space out there is is actually a building space, okay. uh, but it's an open uh, deck. It's a balcony. Porch area. It's a balcony leading to the stairs. Balcony. Very good. Thank you. I had a, just a few minor questions here. I see a re reference in your materials here to a bocce ball court, which you plan to remove. The plan shows a shuffleboard court. Is that the same place? Yes, it is. It's shuffleboard and not bocce ball? Well, it was. The, or is it? <laughs> it? It was actually years ago a shuffleboard court. And um, in the latest revision to the main building, they took, <coughs> you're correct, they took out the uh, shuffleboard court, that was the old surveys description, and they replaced it with a bocce court, so we are taking out the bocce court. So. Okay, because on the plans that we have where it shows existing conditions and changes, it still calls it a shuffleboard court. You are correct. Okay, but that's, there's no other court? That we're no, there isn't. Okay. Um, the other question I had is, is on the information you give on traffic and parking, um, and I don't see page numbers here, but you conclude that based on your report from Bill Bray of Traffic Solutions, it's been found that there will be no impact from the additional four units. And I have to say that when I read Bill Bray's letter, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that there is no impact. He said there are going to be three trips during any presented peak hour and less than 36 new trips over a 24-hour period, which is different than no impact. So I, I guess I, you, you come to a conclusion that I don't see supported by the data you've provided. So I just had a question on that. What, what um, is probably not specifically explained in that letter from Bill, and we can get clarity on that, is Currently, there are six two-bedroom apartments in there. We are going with um, eight singles and two doubles for the same number of bedrooms, uh, same number of bedroom units. And I believe that uh, reflective of um, the number of bedrooms is what his report was uh, saying. Uh, but I can, get, I can get clarification on that uh, because it was the same report that was presented last December also. Okay, because this, this letter from October 24, 2010, it talks about an impact which probably is minimal, but it is an impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that would be I will have I will have clarification on that. Okay, the other thing is our cover memorandum here that is obviously generated by the town and not, not by you, says that the, uh, back to the old problem with the septic system, mm -hmm. we've talked about several times, says that it's been identified and the applicant has agreed to make the correction. My understanding is that that correction has been completed. So I just that, was asking for clarification in terms of whether it's perhaps what the actual status is of the, uh, that has the, relating actually, to the grease trap. That's correct. That has all been uh, corrected, and I believe in section G of um, this submittal package, if I haven't tapped it with the museum, um, does state that because that, that was a clarification in there that it had been done, and I believe. 
I noted that on the front cover of that. So it may just be that our internal cover memo didn't pick that. Um, on, on section G, uh, the proposed development reduces the required sewage capacity within the septic field. See attached letter from Albert Frick regarding the capacity of the existing septic field. Mr. Frick's recommendations have already been addressed by the inn. So I did have that in there. Okay, so our... All right, do we have any issue on that, Maureen? No. no. Okay, so it is, in fact, has been completed. Thank you. Yes. We don't need to talk about that one anymore then. <laughs> Thank you. In the changes, may I ask a question? Sure. The changes in the design of the building, I, tell me about how that affects the landscaping. Um, what will be uh, the change, with these proposed changes to the building, um, Any of the landscaping immediately up around here or here would now be under the balcony. And so what we will be doing is pushing all of that out. So this landscaping will slide this way. This landscaping will slide this way. That stairwell will disappear and the, some of that landscaping will be brought in here. Obviously this walkway will uh, uh, go away because there's no entrance over here any longer. So the landscaping immediate to the building on the parking lot side and on this side will be adjusted to accommodate the new stairwell, the uh, elevator, and the balcony uh, area. So that, but the rest, this out here will stay, all of this and all of this would stay. You have to cut no trees now? Uh, no, no, everything that uh, had been shown to be removed is still being removed. Thank you. I guess the motion that's in order would be a motion to table since we don't do a formal completeness motion. Would anyone like to make that motion with or without a public hearing? Stay on the roll. Sure. Go for it, Carol. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of In by the Sea LLC for site plan review to build a new 600 cottage building located at 40 Bowery Beach Road be tabled to the regular November 15, 2011 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Do we have a second? Henry? All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? All right, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. That is the last item on our agenda for tonight. And if no one has anything else to raise, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion we adjourn. Second. All in favor? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>